This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Four minutes after 10. I I want you to bear with me because I'm going to talk about 30p Lee before I talk about Diane Abbott. And I want you to understand why. You know that I believe, and I think we all know somewhere inside us, that race and class are inextricably intertwined in this country. It is uh, impossible to separate racism from what you could loosely describe as snobbery. And the closest that a white British person will get to understanding or being on the receiving end of the kind of discrimination that people of colour routinely endure would be class-based discrimination. Um, Because I found myself feeling sorry for Lee Anderson in the last 24 hours. Listen, I think the man is is hideous. I I, I think he is repellent in many ways, and some of his pronouncements have been obnoxious to to the point of performative. But I felt sorry for him for two reasons. I felt sorry for him because he looked so disconsolate at that press conference with the reflux party. And he looked so miserable sitting on the back benches of the House of Commons yesterday next to George Galloway. He had the look of a man who had a sniff of majesty, who got close to... I mean, he must be sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, I was deputy chairman of the Conservative Party 10 minutes ago, and now I'm sitting next to George Galloway as the only MP from a made-up party. And literally like that, poof, it's gone. I think he got high on his own supply. I think he began to think that these people were interested in Lee Anderson rather than interested in a useful vessel that could be used to pretend that some fairly simplistic bigotries were somehow working class. Uh, When Rishi Sunak, as a teenager, gave that infamous interview in which he told us that he had working class friends, he has middle class friends, he has working class friends. Well, no, actually, no, not not actually working class friends. That's where where Lee Anderson got hired. He was, if you like... uh, Uh, the right shape to fit into a space that the Tory party and GBBs briefly needed. Somebody who could give the impression of speaking for the masses in the way that the editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail or the uh, multi-multi-million leader of the Conservative Party want to believe that the working classes think. So I actually felt sorry for him. And then I felt sorry for him again this morning when I read that he has been slung out of the Reform Club. Uh, a club that is dedicated to conservatism. I, I, a requirement of membership is that you support the Conservative Party. But I did find myself thinking, when I read that he's already had his letter demanding his resignation, I did find myself thinking that if an old Etonian Tory MP had joined Reflux this week, then would the letter demanding his resignation from that club have arrived quite so quickly? Now, I don't know. I don't know. But I am allowed to say I don't think so. I think if it was an old Etonian who wore the right tie and had been to school with the committee at the Reform Club, then they would probably, probably stroke, possibly turn a blind eye and, and sort of, well, he is still one of us, you know, old boy, old Pip, old Fruit. He's still one of us, isn't he? So let's just, let's just not make a song and dance about it. About it. But they don't because he's from Ashfield and used to work down a mine. Uh, Do I mean the Carlton Club? I think I mean the Carlton Club. Um, uh, How embarrassing, though. I'm not fully au fait with the the Conservative uh, Private Members Club universe. The Carlton Club, some of you are, though. What sort of listeners? How many times do I have to demonstrate that I have a very unique audience for for a radio phone? When I started doing this 20 years ago, if I'd misspoken and got the Carlton Club mixed up with the Reform Club, I'm fairly confident that I wouldn't have got 30 messages correcting me within 10 seconds of speaking. Um, someone's correcting me. Apparently, it's called ref- reform, not reflux. I prefer reflux. I think it just it, it sort of does exactly what it says on the tin. So, I know, I'm not expecting you to feel sorry for him, Ian, or, or indeed anybody else. Troy thinks I've lost it. But it's a human response. It's a human response to a human in pain. Even if they deserve the pain that they're receiving, you are built in two different ways. Uh, you, you can watch someone else suffering and feel nothing, whether they deserve it or not, And you can watch someone else suffering and feel something. So I felt sorry briefly for 30p Lee. Sitting next to George Galloway, I mean, that's enough really to feel sorry for anybody, isn't it? In any circumstances. Sitting next to George Galloway, looking like two, I don't know, looking like two rotting potatoes at the back of the fridge. 
is the, is, the, is the impression that they gave me. So I don't think that I'm going to stop taking the mickey out of him or, or, or suddenly turn into an admirer. Or a fan. I'm just telling you that I think he's been a victim of snobbery and I think he's been a victim of exploitation. I think he's been exploited by some fairly unpleasant individuals and institutions and indeed companies. Um, I think he is still being exploited, actually. Everyone's pedantic today. Did I just say very unique? No, you're quite right, Matthew. You, you cannot have... Nothing can be very... One cannot have... To, 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 to quote, I think, a, a child prodigy on an early episode of the day today, one cannot have gradations of uniqueness. So, no, I apologise if I did indeed say very unique. So, I mention all of that because the sympathy that I feel for Diane Abbott this morning is of an entirely different order. But I wanted to try, probably in vain, to separate it from party political loyalty. If you've listened to this programme for a long time, you'll know that I shouldn't really have to do that because um, I, I was fairly outspoken in my criticism of the last Labour leadership, of which Diane was a, was a key and senior part. So the idea that I am partisan in that context is, is one that isn't actually fair. It doesn't apply in this case. But just in case you feared it did, my, my sympathy, though limited for 30p Lee, is authentic. It is sincere, and, that, and that's why I've explained it. But the sympathy I feel for Diane Abbott, the sympathy I felt yesterday, is something I've never felt for a politician before. I, 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 Natasha Clark and I were discussing PMQs yesterday, and someone told me, you told me actually, you texted me, to say uh, that Diane Abbott was trying to catch the speaker's eye. Diane Abbott was trying to, uh, trying to speak. In fact, Sky News have counted it. She stood up 46 times in 35 minutes trying to catch Lindsay Hoyle's eye, trying to be called to speak. They call it, I believe, I only learnt this yesterday from Natasha, every day's a school day, bobbing. Um, bobbing up and down. 46 times in 35 minutes. I'm not sure my knees would stand that, and I'm a bit younger than Diane. But when I left you yesterday, and Natasha said it so blithely that it, I think, crystallised my confidence that, of course, he's going to call her. Natasha just sort of said, yeah, of course you will. It's bound to happen. We must play the clip when it happens. It didn't cross either of our minds, and she watches Parliament a lot more closely than I do. It didn't cross either of our minds that Diane Abbott wouldn't speak because everybody else was speaking about her. All the men, all the men in the room were talking about Diane Abbott. Keir Starmer was talking about Diane Abbott. Rishi Sunak was talking about Diane Abbott. The men were talking about the woman who had been abused in part for being a woman. And Lindsay Hoare didn't call her. That's not the topic. The reason I think why Lindsay Hoare didn't call her is because he's terrified of upsetting people. I think that he survived by the skin of his teeth his appalling mistreatment of the SNP. Uh, he may have won some brief support, some brief sucker from the Labour Party, from Keir Starmer, who benefited enormously from, uh, his, from Hoyle's convention-defying decision to go with a Labour Party amendment in preference to an SNP motion on one of the only days of the year when they get to set the motions. And so I think that he took the view that because Diane Abbott doesn't currently have the Labour whip, by not calling her to speak, he's not really going to invite the, the wrath of the Labour Party because she's not a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party. While if he did call her to speak, it would be pouring oil upon the fires that Rishi Sunak has managed to ignite around himself by refusing to give the £10 million that the misogynistic, racist abuser of Diane Abbott has given to the Conservative Party. So I think Hoyle bottled it. I really do. And, and I think that in a normal democracy, in a properly functioning parliament, in a place of principle, his job would be in more jeopardy as a consequence of not calling the victim of racism to contribute to a PMQs where the racism directed at her was the main topic of conversation. I think that would put his job in more jeopardy than the SNP decision. But I don't want to upset my Scottish independence supporting listeners. So let's not turn that into a competition. And one thing I've learned over the last few days is that some people find my surprise a little bit silly. And I can't help being surprised. And I know the context of discrimination and racism. I know that the lived experience is constant. I, I found what Diane said about fear 
when she just said, as a single woman, I'm already nervous. I'm already... I don't know why that moved me so much. It really got me right in the, right in the fields. And, and this is a politician about whom I have been able in the past to, to conjure up some fairly negative thoughts, some unkind thoughts, perhaps, even. But that really got me. And the reason why you find my surprise silly is because you think this is par for the course. But I still don't. I still think something has changed this week. I, I still think something has changed this week. I, I still feel on Thursday that lines I thought had consequences have been crossed without consequences. The fact that Rishi Sunak yesterday defended this money. How many Tory MPs could, could pony up 200 grand without really noticing? What's the name of the fellow that still owns a massive estate in Barbados where his family, were, where his ancestors were slavers? Drax, Richard Drax, D-R-A-X. How many of them could pony up? Rishi Sunak could pony up 200 grand without even noticing. I don't know what the rules are, so maybe it wouldn't be the MPs. It would be the do You only need 50, right? You need 50 donors to pony up 200 grand and you fill the 10 million pound shaped hole. So you need 50 Tories to ring around. They could do it at the Carlton Club. They could do it over dinner. They could, you, all you need to do is find 50 Tories who've got a spare 200,000 pounds. And then they could say, we don't want this man's money. Because this isn't just about Rishi Sunak anymore. This is about the entire Conservative Party. It's why Chris Patton has spoken out. Chris Patton, a former chairman of the Conservative Party, who has said that it is, and I quote, an open and shut case. You give the money back. But the problem now becomes more than personal. It's not about, oh, we can't afford to. It's about nobody in that party nobody in a position of influence michael gove touring the studios today having his last go at pretending that he's foreign secretary none of them none of them have done enough none of them have said none of them have tried to undo the harm that has been done or to address the harm that has been done all you had to do was say we don't want this man's money we're going to fill the hole in the party coffers by ringing around by, by passing around the hat, by chipping in. I, I can't keep doing these sums, but it is 50 people giving 200 grand. So that is 100 bit, no, that is, uh, I, I told you I wouldn't be able to do the sums. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do the sums between, I've probably even got that wrong. But, um, but you could get, you know, 100 grand or, or 50 grand off, a, off a, 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 a bigger number of people, but they haven't done it. You haven't done it. Um, I, everyone's correcting me today. I, I start a theme sometimes when I start accepting corrections early in the show. You think that it's... it's, a, it's a, oh, this is the last one. It's from Mike. You got that MP's name a bit wrong, James. His full title is Richard Grosvenor Plunkett, Ernal Earl Drax. Um, uh, he's just one example of, a, of an MP that could plug the whole left by Frank Hester's money and somehow save a little bit of dignity, a little bit of integrity. So that's the question I've got for you today. And I need to make this introduction a little shorter than yesterday's, which broke all records. Have I ever lasted all the way to half past key on the introduction? How much trouble do I get into if I do? Do I have to refund the advertisers? If I, if, if I go, you just get yeah, quite right too. Just cut me off, mate. I'll never learn. But I, I, there are two categories of people listening to this program that I want to hear from today. People who are surprised. 03456060973, black people who are surprised, black people who thought that they lived in a country where this line would have consequences. The man hasn't even apologised. Uh, uh, only Stephen Flynn pointed this out yesterday. A rather splendid uh, comment piece in the Daily Mirror by a young journalist called Serena Richards makes the same point. Uh, yesterday, we were the only people making it. He has not said sorry for being racist or for being sexist. He has said sorry for being rude while denying that he was racist or sexist. Uh, talking about a black woman making him want to hate all black women while being allowed to claim that he wasn't bringing gender or race into it at all. It's actually, it's beyond obscene. It's absurd. It's beyond absurd. It's obscene. Get the words the right way around, James. So, are you surprised? It is now 18 minutes after 10 on Thursday, day three of this story. Day three or day four? Day three of us talking about it. So, day four of the story, because it broke while well, we were off air. And I think they're going to get, I think he's going to get away with it. I think the Tories are going to keep the money. Even as some of the pressure grows, even the Daily Telegraph reports 
<clears throat> that pressure is growing on the Prime Minister. There was a time when a former Tory chairman telling him to give the money back, because it's an open and shut case, would have carried rather more weight than it does in the modern environment. And I am shocked. Is that white privilege? Uh, am I just shocked because I, I don't live with it every day? I don't, I don't see it every day. I'm shocked that he's getting away with it. I'm even more shocked that Lindsay Hoyle didn't call Diane Abbott yesterday. And I am shocked that the Tory party itself hasn't sought to lance this boil. Even if Rishi Sunak can't be relied upon to do it, they complain about his weakness, his lack of leadership all the time behind closed doors. There is absolutely nothing stopping anybody coming to the plate and saying, if we really can't afford to give the money back because he's, he's ponied up 20% of our entire donation fund in the last 12 months, we, we, will, we will replace the money because we don't want to. Every single Conservative MP arrives on your doorstep in a general election campaign propelled in some part by Frank Hester's filthy money. Every single one of you. Or even as you make warm speeches about the need for tolerance and the importance of diversity, even as you uh, opine about the dangers of extremism and the evils of racism, every single one of you turns up on, on, on voters' doorsteps in the general election campaign in full knowledge that some of the financial fuel in your political tank has been paid for with Frank Hester's filthy money. Every single one of you. Every single one of you, whatever your background, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your politics, if you're a Tory and you're knocking on doors, come election time, you're doing so with Frank Hester's filthy money. None of them have done anything about it. I know, I get it. Welcome to the world of the black woman, James, says Miss You. I get it, but I think you might still be shocked. You're still able to be shocked, even if you exist in the context of discrimination, even if you live daily with microaggressions and with this, uh, the fact that they're going to get away with it and that Lindsay Hoyle didn't call Diane Abbott yesterday. In a room full of men talking about her, they didn't let the woman speak. I can't believe it, actually. And if you can... Tell me why. 0345 973 My thanks to Nick, who's just texted to say, don't forget the adverts, James. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.25 is the time, and, and, and like a lot of you, I took Quincy's call home yesterday. Quincy's uh, contribution to the programme, which, which began in, in fairly uh, normal, ordinary fashion, uh, articulate, powerful, but then... I think as much to his surprise as ours, became incredibly emotional as he contemplated the challenge of explaining to his own black daughters what has happened to Diane Abbott this week. And, and he, he broke down. And the support and the love for him that came in was, was extraordinary. But it's another example of it being shocking. What has happened this week is shocking. If it can shock Quincy, then it's hardly surprising that it's going to shock me. Nick's in St. Albans. Nick, what would you like to say? Hey, James, I listen to you most of the time and when I do I get an education about books about reading about life but this as a 50 year old black person this is actually a joke yeah. what's happening to this country what's happening when I started to get into politics it was because of the Monday group and their views on race and what have you it's like a sort of yeah. posh version of the National Front for people who don't, Indeed. Who don't. the Monday Club Indeed. I think it was called yeah and what got me right was i started to read i started to watch um and i started to listen to sort of political discussions right yeah. and i educated myself but i never thought something like this would happen the conservative party the, the, the worrying thing for me is that every country needs a a good shadow party Mm. So let's say the Labour Party wins the next election. The Conservative Party need to be a good shadow party. And how in, in the interests and, of democracy, you need strong opposition. We, we, we saw do. between 2016 and 2019 what can happen if, if there isn't one. There we go. There we go. And to, the, the thing that gets me is now, right, is the only shadow party that I can see coming forward is a party 
that includes Sheila Fogarty, <laughs> you. Um, well, you're, you're uh, very bench. kind, but I, it, that, that does, it is something you won't hear me say very often. Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about let's <laughs> let's talk <laughs> about you. No. Why has no, why but, have you been shocked this week? Because I, I, in some ways, your 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 knowledge of the Monday Club um, yes. should have prepared you for this. What is it particularly that that has that has made Britain a place that you didn't think it was this time last week? It's the fact that nobody, nobody from the government has come through yeah. and said, "Listen, I'm sorry. We need. To, we're going to give the money That's back." Just this is an absolute. Yeah. Like, like Chris Patton said, former chairman, yeah. prominent cabinet minister. Just it's not even yeah. a debate. It's an open and shut case. We can't keep this money. It's like having Mo Salah in front of an open goal, for goodness sake. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I do know what I do know. Well, that's what I thought. I, and, and, of course, by the time I came on air on Tuesday, it was already clear that it wasn't an open and shut case for, for Rishi Sunak. And then Kemi Badenoch offered up her incredibly disingenuous acknowledgement of Frank Hester's non-apology, claiming that it showed contrition, even as he denied that he'd been racist. I, an incredible tweet from the uh, Minister for Women and Equality. So, so that, that is the, so the surprise. Compounded yesterday by Lindsay Hoyle's failure to let Diane Abbott speak in a conversation that was almost entirely about her. That, that, that I, I don't know if that is just him, if that is just a, a constitutional glitch, if it was just an oversight by the speaker. I, I, the poor woman sat up and sat down again 46 times and didn't get called. Do you know who got called last? Do you know who actually got the privilege of addressing Parliament on a day when the racist and misogynistic abuse of Diane Abbott was the chief topic of conversation? Do you know who they called, finally? Do you know who got the last nod? I'll tell you after the news, but you won't believe me. Th think of the list of people that we have found most ridiculous in our parliament over the last seven or eight years. And I'll give you a clue. This one's fairly near the top of it. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10.34 and it's a conversation today about surprise. Why is it surprising? Why are you shocked? that this week's events regarding Diane Abbott and Frank Hester have unfolded in the way that they have. And, and today, for the first time this week, it's a way into this conversation that's open to everybody, not just people with, with lived experience of the sort of thing that Diane has put up with, that Diane Abbott has put up with herself this week, um, excluding, of course, the uh, indignity of not even being called by Lindsay Hoyle, who instead gave the last contribution of yesterday's PMQs to... Drum roll, please. Mark Francois. Uh, and I know you have to alternate between parties, but I also know when they claim they ran out of time, they're rather undone by events of the last two weeks. A fortnight ago, the whole session ran eight minutes longer than it did yesterday. So I'm afraid, Lindsay Hoyle, any claim that you ran out of time just doesn't hold water. But enough about uh, what I think. What do you think? Well, what, what is it? Put into words why you are shocked or why you are not shocked by what happened this week. That, 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 that is, for someone who does this for a living, that, that is where I have ended up. I, I, I didn't think I could be taken by surprise, but I have been taken by surprise every day this week. I wasn't shocked by what Frank Hester said. I know that people like that exist. I know that they are more likely for now to gravitate towards the Tory party. I know that the wealth that you enjoy um, brings privilege and entitlement on a scale that the rest of us can't really contemplate. And I know that if you're in a room full of your own employees, you will say things that you possibly don't even realise are as offensive as they are because there's no one in the room that is going to whisper in your ear that you're being a racist, misogynic, misogynistic pillock. Um, so I get that. That didn't shock me. It's what's happened since that shocked me, up to and including Lindsay Hoyle's behaviour yesterday. So tell me what shocked you, or conversely, tell me why you're not shocked at all. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Carl's in Shipley. Carl, what would you like to say? Morning, Jim. Hello, Carl. Um, as much as you say it's not about you, um, many of us take comfort that you are the voice of the silent majority, because... Um, it's not all negative. There are positives here. The, the, the silent majority in this country, white British people, 
are not as intolerant and, and as racist as some of the sections of the media. You're and, absolutely and, uh, right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I've lost count of the number of times I've read in the Daily Mail or the Daily Telegraph that Lee Anderson speaks for everybody. And you see him yesterday sitting all on his own next to George Galloway like a sort of r- r- rotting potato at the back of the fridge. It's just not true, is it? That these, these, it's not. It's, it's, it's not. More, most people in this country have human values. They are decent people. Um, yes, um, a lot of the multiculturalism of the last 50, 60 years has been a challenge for everyone because we've been thrown together overnight. But most most people respect and value other people for who they are. And the stalking up, including with even some of your co-presenters and others in the media, the stalking up of people's emotions that the other mm. is some, some way the enemy you know, uh, thank God that the majority of white British people in this country do not buy it. They do not I buy it. That's a really and, important point that's actually probably been a bit overlooked this week, in, in, including by me. And that's why they have to write these desperate articles claiming that this is what everybody secretly thinks. This is the if it's the silent majority, why, why are they polling ten percent? Exactly, exactly. And unfortunately, many people with the lived experience are not shocked with what happened yesterday. Because we've, you know, we've gone through that most of our lives, the level of injustice, you know, blatant unfairness, uh, and the, you know, the much harder journey we have to take just to live a quality of life. So, no, we're not shocked. But the education this week for the whole public to see, the nation to see, has been of benefit for everyone to, to get that window into life from, you know, those that really are up against it, um, again, with those people in power who misuse that power. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, 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 I guess the shock, the privilege of shock, the luxury of shock that I have comes from the failure of the response. Because, look, Chris Patton is shocked. He's a former chairman of the Conservative Party. So, so I don't think I'm going down a particularly lonely furrow when I say I just presumed. When I saw the story on Monday, I presumed that by the time I came on air on Tuesday, they'd have done it. They'd have given the money back. They'd have cut him loose. But, but you're not even shocked by that. Not at all, because many people, you know, even just driving to and from work, you know, you get stopped under very spurious charges by, you know, a, a police traffic. You go to court, you, 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 you know, it's, it's clear that, you know, you, you are not guilty of what has been, but yet still the outcome of the jurisdiction is against you. What can you do? Uh, well, you do? Yeah, yeah, I guess that is a... a, 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 a you know, it's simply a case of me not really being able to walk in your shoes. And, and Chris Patton is also a, a, a you know, middle class white bloke like me. So we thought the Tory party would give the money back. Um, you kind of thought that they wouldn't. 10.40 is the time. I don't know if this counts as a defense of Lindsay Hoyle, but it is important because facts matter. The order paper lists the MPs who have won the right to ask a question. Andrew Sparrow explains this very well in The Guardian today. Um, and... He did everything by the book because of the 15 MPs on that list, 11 of them were from opposition parties. So he has to call Tories who were not on the list to keep things balanced. Ed Davey gets a question every six weeks or so. He got that, that, that popped up yesterday. That takes up another opposition slot. The gap between Richard Graham and Will Quince was one place where he could have uh, gone to Diane Abbott and the gap between Will Quince and Miriam Cates was another Richard Graham filled the first gap between Keir Starmer and Stephen Flynn and Ed Davey filled the filled the second gap so they did genuinely run out of time and the speaker didn't even reach the final names on the list David Allen Green the doyen of legal commentators for my money he points out that it was eight minutes longer last week but I, I guess the um uh, the, the conclusion is that Lindsay Hoyle could have bent the rules a little bit to allow Diane Abbott to speak. But the last time he bent the rules, he nearly lost his job in the context of the Labour amendment and the and the SNP motion. So I, I don't know. Maybe maybe he isn't quite as culpable as as we believed originally. Rishi Sunak, however, he is. Keith reminds me it's not the knocking on doors anymore as much as the leaflets coming through your letterbox every single leaflet coming through your letterbox encouraging you to vote for a tory mp will have been paid for in part with frank hester's racist or or the racist abuser of diane abbott's money every single leaflet every single mp oh he's apologized except he hasn't oh he's contrite except he isn't Every single leaflet going through every single letterbox in every single constituency in this country will have been paid for with Frank Hester's dirty money. 
Frank Hester's filthy Luca. Every single one of them. Whoever it is, even the Tories that have spoken out, and I can't really think of any, properly spoken out, uh, called for the money to be returned. It's the acid test of how serious they are in their condemnations of his words. Every single one of them is getting it. Um, 10.42 is the time. I'm going to read this from Tracy because I think it's a valid contribution, albeit a little unkind. Uh, I normally mentally switch off whenever Diane Abbott speaks, James, but today I really want to hear what she wants to say. Um, well done. This is a really important shout. And, and there is a piece that she's written in The Guardian today, which I would urge you to read. It's, it's very powerful. It's beautifully written. But yeah, I, I, I would really like to hear what Diane has to say as well. Um, so if you're listening, and I think you might be, and I know you don't really want to do interviews today, um, there's a lot of people here that would like to hear your voice in a way that you were denied in the House of Commons yesterday. Anna is in Battersea. Anna, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. You're very um, um, Great fan of yours, but I'll get straight to it. Um, I'm a black woman in, living in London, and yesterday as well as the dull grey weather, just really saddened me to the core. And I just think Diane Abbott is a 70-year-old black woman who is one of the first black MPs to be in Parliament. And as a 70-year-old woman, having to get up 46 times and be ignored by really the constituency that's representing the whole country, for me, it just sends that powerful signal that, you know, black women, whether which part of the society, at the top of the chain, right down to the bottom. It it should have. It should have been. Whatever the rules are. I I, I mean, Andrew in The Guardian makes the point. John Burko probably would have found a way to bend the rules, to squeeze Diane Abbott in at the end, even if the session had overrun by 10 minutes. It it is a conscious choice, whatever the reasoning behind it may be. And I can't argue you. I wouldn't want to argue you out of the position that if it was somebody like Boris Johnson or Jacob Rees-Mogg in Diane Abbott's position, impossible though that is to imagine, they would not have been denied their say yesterday. No, she was silenced, you know, and I think it was uh, intentional. I can't, that's the... That's the conclusion I come to, James. Mm. Um, You know, and it just, it is difficult. I don't want to keep talking about the challenges, but as a business owner, running my business, I'm in places where I'm the only black woman in the room, even up until yesterday, in a government sort of led environment. You know, everyone's hands were shaken. It was my sister who attended. And she just got ignored. They didn't want to shake her hand. And it's just like, where it is exhausting. It's twenty twenty four. When when is this ever gonna make any sense? And when the country, the people who are running the country are doing this, can you imagine all the different layers of people who are silent daily, who have to take that deep breath and like, you know, try and get on with life? How how are black women protected? I mean, just recently they were saying that six that women have been murdered uh, unexplained. One was found in the River Thames yesterday. I mean, I'm just drawing relative um, situations that are happening and that are being ignored and not getting the attention. And it just goes on, James. Where, where, where does it end? I don't know where it, it ends. I don't, has it, anything this week surprised you? I, I, I mean, in the sense that, and I, I keep coming back to this, by the time I came on air and started talking to you on Tuesday, I thought yeah. they'd have dealt with this. I thought, this, well, this is a no-brainer. Like Chris Patton, former chairman of the Conservative Party, this is, yeah. just doesn't even need thinking about. They'll have, they'll have nipped this one. They'll have short, sorted this one out immediately. And they didn't. And, and that's the point, James. That mm. is exactly it. I was actually, I thought I was in the twilight zone. I thought, yeah. hold on, are we debating whether yeah. what he said was A, extremist, B, yeah. racist, like I actually thought this this is a I mean a different world where where is the difficulty here you know and then you know everyone would say if it was a, a Jewish person anyone else yeah. but a, a, something happening to a black woman is seen as no let's not rock the boat here and I think it was Michael Gove this morning on GNTV who who did say actually it is racist 
But why did it take 48 hours? Why are we all having to have this conversation? And I draw back to your other caller, and I would say, thankfully, this is not the sentiment of the majority. I think that's a really important thing to remember. I, I'm more comfortable hearing it from you or from Carl up in Shipley as, as, as black people because for me to sit here as a middle-class white bloke and say, hey, it can sound as if I'm saying, hey, calm down, don't worry, it's not as bad as you think it is. And so it, it is important to be reminded of the fundamental decency of most of us, even even as the most powerful engines in the in the country media wise are, are constantly telling us that people like 30p lee anderson and possibly even frank hester speak for the silent majority it's yeah, mad, isn't it? I, I would say james that i'm not walking the streets of south of london seeing the average white man thinking no. he's looking at me and he wants and he to shoot me wants, and he wants to shoot me <laughs> no but what i am thinking is that there are a few lunatics out here who may think Hey, yep, this is an opportunity here. Yeah. And and that's the worrying part because it's the, the, the those are the people that get their headlines who then plant a seed in maybe innocent minds, you know, because for every action there's a reaction. And then you think, what is this going to lead on to? What message does it send to someone who's already possessed of some of some grim opinions or so or some vile views that the message it sends is well if a rich bloke can call for someone to be shot i mean let's just obviously all hope not hope that this speculation will remain speculation but the endorsement that has been given to frank hester despite claims about contrition and apology will be coming through a letterbox near you soon they will still spend his money on trying to persuade you to vote for them even as we know that the source of that money is filthy uh, I, 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 I mean, I can't. Yesterday, I couldn't get past the fact that everyone was talking about the apology, even though it wasn't an apology. Thankfully, Stephen Flynn picked up on that at PMQs. Today, I'm reflecting upon the fact that the amount of money he's given is 20% of the total that they got last year, or, or total that they got the most recent audit. And that means every leaflet going through every letterbox trying to get you to vote for that Tory MP has been 20% of it has been paid for by Frank Hester's filthy money. And they're all cool with that. Every single one of them is cool with that, unless they've said they're not. And guess what? They haven't. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10.54. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the question of surprise and shock is, is there today. So as stories develop and some people hope disappear our reactions to them, our responses to them can change. Sometimes we review our responses as, as time passes. And I, it took me a moment to realise why my surprise had developed, why it had increased. And it's because I thought I'd be coming to... I do this sometimes. If a story breaks after one o'clock, I little have a little mental Rolodex showing my age. And, and I think, oh, that might, that might work tomorrow. That might be something you would want to talk about tomorrow. Or, well, God forbid, that might be something you might want to listen to me talking about tomorrow. I sometimes even think that. And I remember thinking, I wonder how we'll be able to handle this story about Frank Hester. Because by the time I go on air at 10 o'clock tomorrow, the Tories will have binned him. The Tories would have given the money back. I genuinely believed that. I hadn't properly processed that thought. It's probably why I came on air on Tuesday. I don't know if you remember. I didn't know what to say. I, I actually didn't know what to, I didn't know where to go. I thought I, remember, I, I couldn't have a debate about it because it was undebatable. It was, as Chris Patton, the former chairman of the Conservative Party, said, an open and shut case. But the Tories thought it was. They thought it was debatable. They thought it was nuanced. They thought that saying sorry I wasn't racist equaled an apology for being racist. It's just got madder and madder and madder, this story. So I am surprised by how it has developed. I am shocked by what the Tory party has become. Are you? If you are, why? If you're not, why aren't you? Victoria's in uh, Curry Rivel, Curry Rivel in Somerset. Victoria, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted... I mean, I've, I listen to you frequently, and okay. I, but I'm really nervous because I've never done anything like this, but I was just... What are you doing? So, <laughs> I was so gutted to hear that, that Diane Abbott didn't get the opportunity to mm. speak yesterday. Like you, I just thought it was an absolute no-brainer that, you know, it was an exceptional circumstance and surely they must let her have a voice. Yes. Um, 
I might just say it's a really dark day for humanity, whether you're black, white, you know, it, I, I, I'm just gutted. Um, Adam, Adam, makes... Adam Bolton, the, the, the um, political journalist, for, formerly, of course, the, the, the Don over at Sky News, has pointed out there are plenty of precedents for the speaker yeah. doing this. If, if, even if the conversation was just about your constituency or about, about an issue that was obviously pertinent to you, there, there are plenty of examples of MPs being called out of turn. Yeah. So it's a, it's a conscious just, decision. I, I just feel, you know, I'm a middle-aged white woman mm. and I just... Um, contributors today who are black I just you know it made me feel even more sad to just hear them so exhausted and just accepting that this was you know going to be the way that it was that L- she wasn't going to get nose. her voice heard less shock yeah. to the nose I think is probably and the way I, to put it. yeah sorry um and I just, you know, I just find it completely ironic on the day that they're trying to push through this extremism legislation, yes. how, you know, the vile, despicable and, like you said, filthy words that um, Frank Hester um, yes. Sad. spewed out of his mouth aren't classed as a form of incitement. You know, it just, it's it's too ironic for words and well, yet there are some there, there's some commentary today some legal commentary today suggesting that there, that there may be um a, 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 a problem there legally but that's that's for lawyers to yeah. decide what, what is remarkable yeah. i don't know i didn't hear many interviews tom did a cracking job with gove today I asked him a couple of zinging questions but i don't know whether anybody asked him if calling for an mp to be shot would count as undermining uh, or, 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 or but, but liberal parliamentary democracy. I, I presume it would, wouldn't it? I presume that, uh, at least under some readings, yeah. Frank Hester's words would be in contravention of Michael Gove's shiny new definition of extremism. Well, ex- exactly. That's that's the thing, isn't it? I d- oh, your phone line's gone again. Uh, so I, I let you off the first time, uh, and, I, and I filled in the gaps myself on what I thought you might have been saying. But But it is... Has anyone asked that? I don't know. I, I, you know I'm, I'm a bit busy in the mornings. I can't be watching the telly all the time or following every interview. But has anyone asked whether or not Frank Hester calling for an MP to be shot would be a contravention of Michael Gove's shiny new definition of extremism? I'd be amazed if they hadn't. Um, but I'd quite like to hear his answer. Uh, I, I squeeze it. No, I won't. I'll hit this news on time because I, uh, you know it's Thursday. So 12 o'clock for Mystery Hour, our weekly opportunity to have a little bit of fun together. Before that, Hope Not Hate have published some reports, uh, published a new report. You may have heard elements of it in the bulletin looking at um, uh, the rise in extremism. I, I, I don't know whether it was time to coincide with Michael Gove's announcement today or not. Looking at the explosion of anti Semitism and indeed Islamophobia since the October the 7th terror attack in Israel by Hamas. We'll be talking to Joe Mulhall from Hope Not Hate at the, um, at the 11.45. 11.30, Henry Riley will be here. He's been attending Keir Starmer's speech on a subject that I hoped to turn into the second topic of discussion today. But there's no time, and I don't want to move on yet, because I still want to explore more of your shock. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, I, I think Naga Manchetti on BBC Breakfast might have put it to Michael Gove that calling for an MP to be shot might, might contravene his shiny new definition of extremism. Interesting to hear him there in the clip. That would have been talking to Tom Swarbrick on LBC earlier today, um, talking about relying on academics to determine whether or not anybody has uh, breached his new definition of extremism. That's a bit of a turnaround for old, uh, the country's had enough of experts, isn't it? So who are you going to rely on for this incredibly difficult, nuanced and potentially quite inflammatory decision-making process? Experts, James. Experts. Oh, I thought the country had had enough of experts. What sort of experts are you going to hire? The kind that agree with me. They're my favourite kind of experts. My favourite kind of experts. It's quite remarkable, isn't it? Um, Malcolm says, This issue shows that a wealthy white man can literally say whatever he wants, um, even reveal what he really thinks, and get away with it. Um, whereas perhaps a wealthy man of colour, i.e. Mr Sunak, cannot. I'm assuming that the Prime Minister doesn't truly believe that uh, the apology is good enough in this situation. Well, I am as well, although I'm always slightly wary of falling into the trap of thinking that somebody must think that way because of their ethnicity. Uh, You know, I find the attitudes to immigration in general of 
the children of immigrants to be more challenging than I do when they're not the children of immigrants. Like really, really, really negative views. But but that is a dangerous path to go down. That is that is it, it, in a sense telling somebody to stay in their lane or telling somebody that they should hold certain views because of their ethnicity. I I, I would argue it's not necessarily because of their ethnicity. It's because of their immigration status. So I I don't see it as a colour issue. I find Dominic Raab's rejection of the kind of values and approaches that allowed his own father to be a refugee here just as business are to me as the attitude that people like Priti Patel and Suella Braverman take to immigration in general or refugees in particular but I don't I don't I, I think that's that's a me problem not a them problem I think in part Rue but I, but I do take your point I, I believe that Rishi Sunak knows in his conscience or in what passes for his conscience that he hasn't apologised for being racist he knows that Frank Hester has not apologised for being racist he has apologised for being rude while denying, explicitly denying that he had been either racist or misogynistic because he said that he didn't bring race or gender into it when he said that Diane Abbott makes him hate all black women or makes him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. That black woman over there should be shot, but he's not brought race or gender into it. It's, it's, I mean, it is extraordinary. Between you and me, I was a bit relieved yesterday when Stephen Flynn made that point in PMQs because I thought, I've gone out on a bit of a limb here. Why is nobody else pointing out that he hasn't apologised at all? People I like and respect were praising Kemi Badenoch, albeit that they probably hadn't read her second tweet. They'd only read the first one when she claimed that, that he, he was, that you know, she acknowledged that what he'd said was racist, but then went on to... Um, accept his apology and posit, completely invent his contrition. He hadn't apologised for what she called racist. He'd apologised for being rude while denying he was racist. Everyone's going, well, that's good. That's very grown up. Very finally. I, I, mean, I, mean, I just sit sat here going, no, it's, it's, it's really not. How many times over the last few years have I said to you, I used to think that the Emperor's New Clothes was a fairy tale. Now I think it was a dress rehearsal for my career. Some days I sit here and I go, hang on a minute. Then Boris Johnson, most obviously. Yeah, that bloke, that bloke's naked. That is stark rollick naked. That bloke over there. Did it again yesterday. I said, he's not apologised for being racist. He's apologised for being rude while denying he was racist. And you sort of sit there thinking, oh God, am I going to get, are we going to get into bother after that? Are we going to get something? And then Stephen Flynn stood up in the House of Commons where he is admittedly protected by parliamentary privilege. So if I had got it wrong, uh, I'd be facing consequences that he wouldn't face. But he, he said it so clearly that you sort of go, Whoa! How can that be? How can that be? How can how can everyone be saying he's apologised so we should move on when he hasn't apologised for the offence that he committed against Diane Abbott? Strange times. Are you shocked? I still am. But what bit shocked you? And if you're not shocked, tell me why. Nick's in Manchester. Nick, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hi. Uh, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? This whole I, I thing. think it is. Yes, and and you sort of some days like. Sorry, I just invited you to speak, and I've gone off on another one. No, but please. But there's a please. little bit of me. On Thursday, day three, day four of the story, day three of our conversation, should we talk about something else? Should we move on? Should we, should, I mean, should we not open with it? I'll definitely talk about it today. But should we not open of it? Should we not do it at 10? And you sort of think, no, because no one's really, not, not enough people are actually detailing the disgust, the, the disgusting conduct, the disgusting responses. It is shocking what's happening, Nick. And you have been since... Tuesday, like absolute massive thoughts for, for, for doing mm. that. My hands were itching on Tuesday to uh, pick up the phone and, and say something, but sometimes it is just best to listen. It's best to get kind of get vindication from, yeah. from you, know, you know, people that are going, actually going through this. I'm a black man, I'm not a black woman, but sure. you know, but I, but I and it, for me, it was really important to listen, to it's understand nice the hurt, part. yeah, that, that, that the black, the black, black women were going through. Um, Tuesday was incredible. Yesterday, when you brought it up again, I was like, what an absolute genius. And oh, well, well, enough about it. Enough, enough, enough. Tell me about you. Tell it's me what brilliant. you think. Tell me why you have I'm, been shocked this week. <laughs> um, I, if you um, have. I, I have been, and I haven't been, and, and I'll, I'll explain. I'm not surprised right. at... Um, the fact that the Tories, uh, initially, before obviously uh, the PM decided to come out and say it was racist, were trying to cover it and sweep it under the carpet, obviously, um, with what happened uh, to Sadiq, uh, Sadiq Khan and, yes, and uh, Ipaloo, they did exactly the same thing. Not surprised, of course they did. Not particularly surprised um, at the fact that uh, Lindsay Hoyle dis didn't allow uh, Diane Abbott to, uh, to, to, to speak in Parliament, because again, um, I think Stephen Flynn had an interview with LBC afterwards, and I think... 
the you know he, he did he can answer it. Essentially, it's down to embarrassment. He can answer it, and he's already in enough trouble or issues, you know, um, regarding the kind of walkout with, with, with the SNP sure. and, and the Tories. What, the thing I'm surprised about, and it's very, and, and I find myself finding it a bit weird that I'm surprised about this, because obviously it's horrible, everything that's going on, it is disgusting, and, and it can't be normalised, so I'm disgusted by it, but I'm not surprised at their reaction. What, the thing I'm surprised about is after the speech that Rishi Sunak made last Friday, everything he was saying about terrorism, division, everything... And the fact that so many people are calling for a general election, yeah. would this not be the perfect opportunity to double down on those words? You would have would, thought so. You would have a real opportunity to put actions where the words were. Well, we, we, we've spoken so much about the people that he'd lose, but no one's really speaking about the people that he'd gain. Like, how comes, you know, we know that the toys are a broad church, and mm. yeah, like, he, he's not going to speak to the demographic that, that they've been appealing to since Ruella Bravman. But wait, wait a minute. How about if he just said... Listen, guys, I spoke about this before. Um, this is a key example of what I'm talking about. We want no part of this. We, we're giving the this money is, back. This is an example of what I mean. Yeah. I, I, um, I see that was, as win-win. I, I know I'm being a little bit naive because he's worried about the kind of voters that he thought 30p Lee would bring into the, would bring into the fold. But, it, you know, he would just say, I didn't just make a speech about it. These weren't platitudes. And the best way to show it is by doing something that actually hurts me. Losing this 10 million quid is bad news for the Tory party, but the principle at play is bigger. How, and how positively would it fall in with the, governor's, the government's definition of extremism as well? Oh, there's today? a question. There is a, there is a question that Michael Gove was asked earlier today, and I shall play you, I'll play you his answer shortly, although suffice to say I'm not sure anyone except perhaps Michael Gove will find it satisfactory. I, that's a great point, Nick, and we touched on this yesterday. And What, what does he lose by doing the right thing? And I know what the answer is. Everyone's shouting at the radio, £10 million, James! But, I, you know, like I said, that just involves 50 people ponying up 200 grand each. They could fill that hole in a heartbeat. Go fill it over lunch, couldn't they? Tony's in Wimbledon. Tony, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, good morning, James. Hello. Um, I've just been following everything that's been going on, mm. and I'm shocked, but I'm not surprised, but deeply concerned. And the reason why I'm deeply concerned with it is that we've had a government that from, I would just say, just from the time of David Cameron with his remarks in the Jamaican Parliament telling people to get over, frankly, get over slavery, um, to raise May's hostile environment, which led to the Windrush scenario. Yes. Uh, we've then seen Brexit come along, Boris Johnson with his um, run uh, Farage with their sort of utterances that have been coming out fast and furious. Pretty Patel continued that whole um, home office thing. Sajid Javid came up with the same situation with regard to Shamima Begum. Yeah. Suella Braverman, <laughs> her rhetoric, um, the, the, the mustering of uh, the forces at, um, and not, not the official forces at the Senator. Yeah. I think this then has then to be sort of like offset into then looking at the cronyism and the corruption that we are potentially looking at with regard to government procurement. And that brings us clearly into this whole thing of Mr. Hester and what he's had to say and the simple fact that the, the, the uh, ruling party has taken X amount of money from him and clearly seemed to be messaging that his money, was of, his money is of greater priority. Than the then, principle, um, than the feelings, not just of Diane Abbott, but uh, and, and not just of black women and indeed black voters and black people, but the feelings of everybody who finds Frank Hester's comments ir ir irredeemably awful. That's right. And I think a lot of what we're witnessing is really and truly the government's being quite cold and just basically saying, right, OK, then we are going to operate something which I think personally think is divisional. They're trying to divert, I mean, mm. divide the population, create conflict amongst the population, the various segments of the population, and it forms part, I think, of just an attempt to completely divert people's minds from the government's mismanagement of a nation. So that's basically our well, dividing well, that's rule. That's a brilliant analysis, incredibly detailed as well. A couple mm. of things there I need to, I need to swat up on. I, I only vaguely remember Cameron's visit, that visit to Jamaica in, I think, 2014 or 2015. It'd be 2014, probably. 2015, yeah. I think. But, I, but, but your conclusion is very similar to the one that Diane Abbott has reached in her article today in The Guardian, where she was allowed to have her say in a way that she wasn't in Parliament yesterday. And she's uh, accused the Conservatives of aiming to play the race card in the general election. In other words, to 
to ramp up this sort of rhetoric and create the sort of divisions that you describe in the belief that I think many callers today have at least suggested that it's a vain belief, it's a false belief, it's not a tactic that will be rewarded, but they believe there's votes in it. They believe there's votes in it. I think you're absolutely right there. Um, I have um, just I'm halfway through reading a book called Nazi Billionaires, and it completely, really and truly brought the whole issue of what happened in the Second World War, what led to the Holocaust. And it's quite shocking because uh, I have a friend who incidentally is Italian, but of Indian ethnicity, right. who studied politics. And he gave me an insight into what was fascism. And I've now come to understand that our idea of fascism has been the greater part distorted by the visual imagery of what we saw with the Nazi forces, uh, the uniforms, the big parades and everything like that. But he broke it down into me very simply. He said fascism is a mar- mar- marrying or a merging of government state interest and corporate interest and I think what we've seen with the present government and this incident is that they seem to be quite happy to take Mr Hester's money to support and condone him in many ways and when you then look at the extremes of what Hester actually said I think that is deeply concerning because we've had two MPs who have been murdered I, I, I think you make you make so many powerful points so well that, that it's, it's, I'm almost struggling to keep up. But just to prove one of them, Tony, um, Russell Scott, the investigative journalist who um, uh, whose work we benefit from quite often on the program, he has a, a, a substack at russellscott.substack.com, has been doing a little bit of digging. Do you want to have a guess at how much money the government paid Frank Hester's Phoenix partnership in, in December of last year alone? Uh, up until December last no, year? No, no, in December alone. In December, no idea. 3.7 million spondulix. Right, so 10 million and the returns that you can get off of I that. I don't know what the profit economy. margin is. It's 137 million for the for the whole year to that point. So right. what the profit margin is on that, I do not know. Um, and when we did know, we'd know how much of it he gave back to the people that awarded him the contract. Just to pick up on that corporate... Um, government crossover that Tony alluded to. It's 11.17. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, 21 minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I, I, I think a quick listen to Nagaman Chetty on BBC Breakfast this morning putting to Michael Gove the possibility that his new definition of extremism that he's touring the studios with today, having his last go probably at pretending to be foreign secretary, um, is probably something that Frank Hester fell foul of when he called for a serving MP to be shot. Have a little listen to the question and indeed Michael Gove's response. When um, Frank Hester allegedly said that, and I want to get this quote right, I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. Is that an extremist view? Well, speaking as someone who uh, was pursued uh, by uh, an individual who was trying to kill me and who subsequently succeeded in uh, killing one of my friends in Parliament, I take that sort of language very seriously and I think it's unacceptable. I'm sorry, that's not quite what I asked. Is that an extremist view and would it fall under these new rules, these new definitions of extremism? I can repeat the quote for you if you wish again. Uh, well, I, I take these things exceptionally seriously, and because I take them seriously, it would be the case that uh, uh, any assessment about whether or not an individual or an organisation is extremist would have to follow a rigorous process. It wouldn't be me making a decision on the basis of a quote, however horrific. It would be uh, a due diligence process that would be conducted very carefully. And it would be down, to the, say, gov- it would be down personal- to the government of the time, which you are part of, yes? Sorry? It would be down to the government of the time, which you are now part of. It would be down to uh, uh, an appropriate process that would follow um, independent advice, uh, uh, civil servants who are politically impartial looking at the evidence and that evidence being supplemented by academics. But as I say, um, uh, I take the use or the issuing of these threats very seriously, uh, having, as I say, for the reasons with which you're familiar, um, knowing all too well uh, the dangers that uh, some people in public life have had to face. I agree. Two things there. Uh, one quite obvious, but the second, that he called the words unacceptable, but the money remains acceptable. 
There's a bit of a problem there, isn't there? So the words are unacceptable, but the money's perfectly acceptable. How can the money be acceptable if the words are unacceptable? How can the money be acceptable if the boat giving the money is unacceptable or is saying unacceptable things for which he hasn't apologised? He hasn't apologised for the unacceptable things. He's apologised for being rude while claiming that the things he said weren't unacceptable. They weren't even racist or misogynist. What a strange business this is, and it gets stranger by the minute. 23 after 11 is the time. Natalie's in Enfield. Natalie, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. I just wanted to say thanks for keeping this in the forefront of the British public's mind. Well, some um, of the British public. Really. Yeah, some of them. <laughs> Go on. Um, I'm very heartbroken and I'm crushed because as a black woman, to hear the insult, the racist remark that was said, I don't care if it was said privately. For me, that speaks volumes. Mm. To attack Diane in that way, she's a trailblazer, the first black woman MP, the longest serving black MP. And the abuse that she receives is intolerable. It is Sometimes I've read the comments myself and I thought, how does she get up, go through the door and still try and believe in democracy, hope? And as a black woman, I see this all the time. So in a way, even though I'm shocked, I'm not really because I know that's what people think. And this politics, this this season that we're in, it's so divisive, it's so toxic. But yet Diana can be abused in in such a way. To say to her that all black women, you hate all black women, she just makes you want to hate all black women. Yeah. And she deserves to be shot. Now, I've got a young black daughter who gets up every morning, goes to uni, and one of the first things she said to me, Mum, am I going to be safe out there then as a black woman? Am I going to be looked at the way he's looked at Diana Abbott? This is ridiculous. I think he should be stripped of his OBE. The money should be used for maybe some outreach in the black community. Something that he wouldn't like it to be used for. The same people that he's against, it should be used for us to build up our community. Did you, when you first heard it, presumably on Monday afternoon, did, yeah. did, did you think that the money would still be in the Conservative Party's coffers by Thursday lunchtime? Oh, yes, I did. You I really did. You bet, you... Because it's about privilege, isn't it? It's about, it's about the chummy society. You know, you've got contracts with, with this young, with, with Frank Hester. It's yeah. all about money. It's all about white privilege. And it is, there is such a thing, a white privilege. Yes, and it's, it's evident. It's yeah. been shown. Because uh, remember, I... when Diana Abbott sat on a train and she had a small uh, can, uh, can of, I think, a 4% something alcohol she had, that coverage was from back to front. It was in columns. It was in opinions. It was in cartoons. Everything. They lambasted her. And I don't see the coverage. I don't see it being on every paper. I don't see people being outraged and demanding he gets stripped of his OBE. Because we're black women. There, no, we're there, there, there is coverage. Visible. There is coverage, and 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 it has been fairly comprehensive, but not 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 the kind that you describe. Not the yeah. col- not the columnist dedicating no. pages to why the Tory party must dispense with this man's money immediately. Why they need to put clear blue water between them and him, for the sake of of decency, for the sake of society, Im- Im- immediately. And actually, I I go for the other one. I don't go for the mojito on the train. I go for the more recent one where Laura Trott, chief secretary to the Treasury, the second most powerful position in the Treasury, second only to the Chancellor, gave an interview to Evan Davis on Radio 4 where she clearly didn't know what GDP was and certainly didn't know what the relationship with debt and GDP was and and was, I think, susceptible to the accusation that she wasn't even sure what percentages were. And that received a tiny, tiny, tiny scintilla of coverage compared to when Diane Abbott sat in this studio with Nick and and forgot the numbers um, or, or didn't have at her fingertips the, 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 the numbers to answer the question that he asked. The numbers existed. She just didn't produce them in time and embarrassed herself. And the coverage that that received compared to the chief secretary to the Treasury not knowing the relationship between GDP and national debt was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, truly, even thinking about it now, I can't make sense of it, except through the lens that you've just described, Natalie. Yeah. But James, can you imagine if it was a civilian that said, I want to shoot, shoot Diana Abbott, all black women? Can you imagine? I'm sure he'll be arrested by now. What he said to her has shaped her to her core. To say that I'm frightened, um, she's, she's making yeah. everybody see her vulnerability. But yeah. with black women, we're not allowed to be vulnerable because we're supposed to be strong. We're resilient. We can take anything. We're tough. It goes to the... If you look at the statistics, black, black women, maternal, maternal care, yes. half of us don't make it out. Or some of us are not believed when we're going through pain or we're going through anxiety. So can you imagine how she feels to put the key through her door and be in her home where she should feel safe? She doesn't feel safe right now. And that's all because of this idiot. 
Beautifully put. Uh, beautifully put. I, I'm just going to add Emma's words because they resonate with me on the question of apology, on the question of doing what seems to so many of us to be the obviously right thing, uh, including Chris Patton, who's a really helpful example because he's a former chairman of the Conservative Party, a former cabinet minister. Emma writes, if they apologise, they will lose face. Remember the hyper-masculinity of the white supremacist. There'll be a certain segment of their base who manage to ignore Rishi Sunak being non-white and non-Christian as long as he is an unapologetic capitalist, but he's still on shaky ground. If he's seen to be apologising, one, to a black woman, two, for misogynoir, noir, three, perpetrated by this character, and four, it's an ideological outrage. Because one, apologising is weak and unmanly. These are Emma's words. Only gays and women should apologise. Apologize. Gammon just get mad and therefore strong. On two, uh, a, a, a woman who has the temerity to be already above her station and vocally at that. Oh, the, comp- the, the compiled horrors that entails. Three, um, it doesn't exist. The wo- woke ideology that's designed to emasculate the white race. And four, a very rich white elder who has earned the privilege of free speech by virtue of being very, very rich. It's the final bit that is Rishi Sunak's knockout blow, restricting the speech of a rich white man. The disgust at, a, at abeyance to the looming devil of wokeism is, is just a day with a Y in it for these charmers. That's really well put. Trying to make sense of it. Listen, you can chalk it up. Uh, in one dimension uh, they need the money in two dimensions they can't afford to alienate future donors who may have skeletons in their closet you can chalk it up in three dimensions emma goes into five six seven dimensions there with the bottom line being the abiding takeaway thought being that you, you cannot he cannot risk telling sections of his support both actual and potential that a rich white man gets his freedom of speech restricted even as Michael Gove tours the studios today, explaining why he should have the right to restrict everybody else's. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 26 minutes to 12, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I I must get onto this subject tomorrow. I hope I do. There'll be time. Uh, Because I think it's one of the most powerful things Keir Starmer's done so far. I hope Henry Riley isn't going to disabuse me of the notion. But, you know, we talk about authenticity in politicians. And when Keir Starmer talks about music, he he sort of, he he resonates like a tuning fork with with authenticity. He, He was a very talented musician wise enough to know he couldn't make a career out of it but but a proper musician a flautist i think the uh, first time he ever went abroad was with a youth orchestra when, when, when he traveled to other countries and he's spoken of the transformative nature of, of of music for him for me it was drama but i went to the kind of school that had its own theater had a gothic theater where rupert everett had previously trodden on the boards and indeed james norton uh, after I left, some, some years later, James Norton would have availed himself of the kind of advantages that, uh, that having your own theatre and a really th- big drama department can, can bestow upon a child. But I, I, having gone to a school like that doesn't mean I can't see the need for introducing... In fact, I'd say the opposite was true. It makes me even more uh, alive to the benefits that are being denied to people up and down the country if their schools do not routinely provide them with access to the arts. It's a, it's a win, 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 win. The only people it frightens, I have to tell you, are the people that um, Tony was referring to a moment ago. Uh, what was it, Tony? I think it was Tony. Uh, fascists. Fascists hate the arts. Uh, they, they hate the arts for two reasons. Number one, they can't control them. And I don't mean all arts. There's always a few favoured artists that they've got time for. Uh, They can't control art. Creativity creates rebellion. But even more importantly, creates empathy. Creates empathy. You go and see a play about a Holocaust victim. You watch a film about the Holocaust. You you, you respond to it in a way that you would not respond to a history book, a drama, a story. It's why Mr. Bates versus the post office reached places that years of journalism by the likes of Private Eye and Nick Wallace and Computer Weekly and others had just not reached. It, it, a story. We are a, a, a species of storytellers and story lovers. And that's why access to the arts, because music tells stories, not just operas, but symphonies tell stories. They take you to places. Uh, Starmer describing, I think, Beethoven's Ninth as heroic. It's a beautiful word to use to describe a piece of music. 
And to deny access to the arts to as many people as possible is to deny the country its proper future, its richest, most fulfilling and fulfilled future. So I, uh, I, I love the early reports on what he was due to speak about today, which is one of the reasons why Henry Riley is there um, and now speaking to us from the City of London. Well, good morning, James. Uh, he did speak about that international trip that you referenced. It was to Malta, where he was uh, going to play the flute, which was his first uh, first ever international trip. Now, Sir Keir Starmer today, you're right. I mean, this is clearly a big passion of his. It's one of the things uh, in the speeches I've been to see him where he's been uh, most eloquent, most fluent and indeed passionate about. He was returning to his old stomping ground, actually, the Guildhall School of Music. The Labour leader um, used to be a junior scholar here, described arriving as an 11-year-old with his flute under his arm, though sadly he didn't play it today. He said he'd spare the audience that, but he sort of described about how he used to come up on weekends from the age of 11 until around 18, where he said he had long hair and flared jeans. And as Sakir explained, his enjoyment of classical music in that time has actually increased. These encounters with art and culture change us forever. Uh, and they certainly changed me forever. And when I left my little village of her screen, and went to the city of Leeds to go to university, I discovered a whole new world of indie bands, orange juice, wedding present, back then uh, with a guitar that was lent by my good friend John. And even now, even now, listening to Beethoven or Brahms as I read the Sunday papers uh, takes the edge off some of the more uncomfortable stories. <laughs> Uh, 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 and that's the power of your industry. It is not just a nice to have. It's essential for our economic growth as well as our personal growth, who we are. So probably leaving himself open to some criticism there, sort of, you know, listening to Beethoven, reading the Sunday papers, but being very upfront and very honest about how he enjoys classical music. Um, this was a keynote speech today to really set the vision for arts, culture, creative industries. He then held a Q&A with the actor Kush Jumbo. And in terms of how Labour will do it, well, Sakir said that it was time for a change in mindset. He said that the creative industries are not just important to brand Britain, they are brand Britain. The Labour leader described that as starting within our schools. He said we need more creativity in our schools. He would put it at the heart of our curriculum and explains why he didn't think that the current system was working. Right now, one of the measures of excellence is the Tory EBAC, an accountability measure that values Latin and ancient Greek, but not music, drama or art. Seriously, in what world does learning to act, dance, sing or paint count less than learning a language from more than a thousand years ago? The ancient Romans and Greeks would actually have had quite a lot to say uh, about that. So from day one, day one, Labour will reform the school accountability framework to make sure that arts count. James, the two key figures that Sir Keir Starmer was interested in, firstly, he said that GCSE enrolment in arts subjects is down 47% under the Conservatives. He then also explained that at awards ceremonies, be that the BAFTAs or the Oscars, 60% of those nominated are from state schools. He would like to see that much, much higher. He said there is a huge talent in this country waiting to be unlocked. And then lastly, he spoke of the snobbery as well that you were referencing at the start, James. He said that anyone who thinks that the arts are a soft subject are wrong. This is not a middle class hobby. It's people who don't get it. He also said that the Tories, in his words, had been snobbish towards Angela Rayner, enjoying the opera recently. Um, and finished by saying the best thing he'd seen recently, which had really made him stop and think, was James Graham's play, Dear England, which, of course, uh, is about the England football team. He said his kids are very much enjoying the Wonka movie and that his shadow culture secretary, Thangnam Debonair, has been told off by the parliamentary authorities for practising her string quartet at unsociable hours and very loudly. And some, some big names supporting him as well, I think. Yeah, he, as you referenced right at the start, so James Norton, um, what are those supporters? The artist uh, Damien Hurst, another one of those supporting him. Beverly Knight, the singer. Um, there were some notable faces in the audience as well, from the likes of you had Netflix, Paramount Pictures, Warner Brothers, Pinewood Studios. 
I was sat on a row with um, Tristram Hunt, who used to be a Labour MP, now mm. runs the Victoria and Albert Museum. You had Lord Smith was also on my row, who was a, a former Labour Culture Secretary. Very much the, the great and the good here at the Labour conference, with uh, Thangnam Debonair also sat there laughing at, um, at Sir Keir Starmer, sort of exposing her, her string quartet. Well, yeah, she's a cellist, I think, isn't she? Was it, well, he said string quartet, yes, I you think she is a cellist, yeah. I think, I, I think yeah, there's a slight delay on the line, so unfortunately I can't ask you about the very, very famous Hollywood actor that you went to school with. Uh, <laughs> oh, what a shame for that delay. <laughs> oh, maybe another time. <laughs> Henry Riley, live from the City of London. Can we do that clip again, the first one? I just, I, I, listen, um, <clears throat> again, as with opening the programme saying, I feel sorry for 30p Lee at the moment, you'll have to rewind to find out why. I don't care who the politician is that comes out with something like this. I just find it so important and so powerful and, and so moving. And have a listen to Keir Starmer here. Listen to the fluency with which he speaks. Listen to, listen to, 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 to the passion. It's like uh, he removed himself from the constant self-editing that politicians these days, or certainly Labour politicians, have to do to, to avoid um, putting a foot wrong or, or misspeaking or getting hauled over the coals for having a curry when you're allowed to call for a Labour MP to be shot if you're a Tory donor. I, I, just, I just found this probably the most authentic that you've ever heard him, unless, of course, you've listened to my full disclosure interview with him from a couple of years ago. These encounters with art and culture change us forever. Uh, and they certainly changed me forever. And when I left my little village of Hurst Green and went to the city of Leeds to go to university, I discovered a whole new world of indie bands, orange juice, wedding present, back then uh, with a guitar that was lent by my good friend John. And even now, even now, listening to Beethoven or Brahms as I read the Sunday papers uh, takes the edge off some of the more uncomfortable stories. <laughs> Uh, 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 and that's the power of your industry. It is not just a nice to have. It's essential for our economic growth as well as our personal growth, who we are. That's, that was lovely and worth listening to again. Um, all being well, we'll be able to have a conversation tomorrow about what it did for you. And, I, and I'll do it slightly differently from how I've done it before. So I, I don't want to hear from people whose career has been built upon their exposure to the arts at an early age. I want people like Keir Starmer, if you like, who went to um, state schools uh, and and come from social classes, perhaps where you wouldn't automatically be exposed to this sort of thing. The difference it's made to your life, even though it didn't influence your career, I don't think there is much more um, important uh, stuff out there than the inner life of humans and art and culture feed the inner life of humans in the same way that actual food feeds the outer life. Uh, it's just turned quarter to 12. Up next, we'll be looking at Hope Not Hate's latest report into an explosion of extremism, particularly in the aftermath of the uh, terror attack of in Israel of October the 7th by Hamas, of course. And something of particular interest to us given some of the conversations we have on the program the, the the circumstances that create a particular vulnerability to far right provocateurs far right uh, talking points and indeed far right individuals james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it's 10 to 12, Miss Chair on the way. Um, before that, uh, Joe Mulhall is with us to have a look at the annual uh, Hope Not Hate report into the state of hate. Before that, some people clearly need a bit of a heads up on Keir Starmer's speech there. Orange Juice was a band. He didn't discover Orange Juice when he went to Leeds University, uh, having previously been surviving, I don't know, on pond water or something. I, I, it, Orange Juice was a rather splendid band led by the magnificent genius Edwin Collins. So that that I, I admit I'm surprised he's a fan of wedding present as well. But the but orange juice the band is what he discovered when he went to Leeds University, not orange juice the beverage. I thought we'd better clear that up before before it gets halfway around the. What he'd never had orange juice before he went to university. It's unbelievable. I'd never have anchovies before I went to boarding school, but orange juice and everyone's had an orange. You know what? I'm, anyway. Um, Joe Mulhall, Director of Research at Hope Not Hate, is with us. Um, it's an annual event. Uh, I presume that you start off on a project like this, hoping that each year we'll see an improvement in the kind of phenomena that you track, because you're, you're looking essentially, essentially at the world of the far right in the UK. I, I could be wrong, but I suspect that that isn't 
generally your experience? Unfortunately not, no. I mean, I'd love that each year we could say a decline in the number of far-right terrorism convictions, a decline in the number of far-right protests, a decline in the number of uh, kind of anti-migrant protests at accommodation. But it's not this year uh, once again, unfortunately, and and it was record numbers in many cases in 2022. The numbers again in the report this year, unfortunately, are up again. And, And the polling as well, there's a huge amount of polling in this year's report. And again, the, the, the figures are getting worse year on year. So it's a really troubling time. Um, what, what, what jumps out? I mean, what should we be particularly, particularly with reference to the polling? What should we be particularly concerned about? The big thing this year, I think, is, is there is just such a sense of decline and pessimism across, across British society. Um, you know, the numbers of people that are saying that politics doesn't represent them, that the country's moving in the wrong direction, that their life uh, is going to be worse than their parents is extraordinarily high. Mm. And, and we know for a fact over many, many years that when people are in that sort of headspace, they're much more susceptible to politics, to far right politics, to radical right politics, because the far right offer very, very simple answers to extremely complex questions questions and they can give you someone to blame. So the sense of pessimism is terrifying. I think the other thing that's really worrying this year is this kind of, we talk a lot about the emergence of this radical right ecosystem. And, you know, I think lots of the papers in the last few years, we've talked about Europe, we've talked about the AFD in Germany, we've talked about the Sweden Democrats, we've talked about Le Pen, and and Britain's often seen as a bit of an exception because we don't have this huge kind of radical right force in Parliament. Um, But it's happening in British politics as well. And we go into real detail about how the Conservative Party, the right of the Conservative Party is radicalised. And we have this media ecosystem around it, GB News, the Telegraph shifting, the Spectator shifting, and of course, reform as well. This radical right scene, which is very, in some senses, indistinguishable from those European far right parties, is happening in Britain as well. But it's happening in the Conservative Party here rather than as a new party outside of it. That's, I mean, it touches on quite a lot of the conversations that we have on this program and I, I, I won't bore you with some of the things that, uh, that that have occurred to me while conducting those conversations but i am interested in why you think it is such strong beer why it's such an intoxicating invitation to to blame your own unhappiness or your own problems upon the people recently arrived or theoretical who've got even less than you rather than uh, at risk of you know, paraphrasing Nye Bevan rather than the people who've got lots, lots more than you, because most of the things you just described are owned by some of the richest people in the country. Of course, right, and and I think or indeed I'm, not even in well, the country. Exactly. Just, I mean, actually, it reminds me a little bit of John Lydon's comments last week that that got some press attention, where he was blaming you know asylum seekers yes. and immigrants for the declining seaside towns. It's always been a really powerful message, which is turning around and saying there's not enough schools, there's not enough houses, there's not enough good jobs. You know, you can see your communities around you decline. And, and it's a very simple answer to say, here's this other group of people that are taking it from you, rather than, as you say, looking at the people who are causing these problems, not least a government that's been in power for over a decade. Um, it's, a, it's a nice bit of scapegoating, and it's a very powerful message. And it's worked, of course, for the last hundred years, and so we shouldn't be surprised it's working now. And there's not much mileage to be had in fighting it either. I mean, I mean, I mean in terms of the media landscape, there aren't many places you can go. I know that I keep reading articles about how the mainstream media is dominated by forces opposed to the ones that you describe in your research, but um, I can normally only name Carol Vorderman and Gary Lineker when I'm, when I'm trying to make it, and they don't even have columns or TV programmes. Oh, Carol happily on the roster here at, mm. at LBC. It's, it's very odd, isn't it, this idea that takes hold, that there, that there are forces stacked against the people to whom the radical right appeal, when in fact the radical right have their hands on almost all the levers of media power in this country now. There's been a really clever sleight of hand. Mm. Uh, for, exactly as you say, you know, if you think about who is causing the problems that we're talking about, who owns the institutions, who has the power in, in almost all senses of society, it's not asylum seekers and it's not you know working class people. And it's why there's a, this narrative that's emerged which they talk about like a new elite, which is this woke elite of liberals and, and all of these characters that supposedly those of us that don't hate transgender people somehow have all of this superpower. Um, when of course the reality is is that there's a, you know, a small number of people that uh, hold huge amounts of power, both politically and economically in this country. Uh, and, and we don't talk about those enough. Uh, well, I'm still waiting for my checks off George Soros. Uh, speaking <laughs> of which, one of the owners of GB News, of course, Paul Marshall, was mm. outed recently, was found as one of your investigations in a, uh, with Lewis Goodall, my colleague, found yeah. to have been sharing all manner of disgusting Islamophobic content on social media in a, in a locked account. That story sort of went away very quickly, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean we, got, we, we got some coverage, but nowhere near as much as we expected. 
affected. As yeah. you say, kind of Paul Marshall that owns a huge stake in GB News. Front, back, back at the front of the queue to buy the Telegraph now we, after the government has changed the law to stop a, a, a Qatari-backed bid succeeding. Ex- exactly right. And so now we're in a situation where this guy, and, and I think some of the response from groups like The Spectator, etc., were saying, oh, you know, people can retweet all sorts of things by mistake or people can say things that aren't that bad. We're talking about, I mean, the, the tweets that were liked and retweeted that my colleague uncovered was really extreme. They were talking about kicking out refugees. They were talking about, you know, uh, civil war in Britain. They were kind of climate change denial stuff. This was a pattern of behavior over a prolonged period, engaging in very extreme stuff. And this is someone that owns a TV channel or partly owns a TV channel that's growing and could end up with a huge bit of our media landscape in the coming years. And I think it's a good example in some senses that what we talk about in the report is this normalization of rhetoric that was traditionally confined to the real margins we are now hearing emanating out of mainstream politics mainstream journalism etc and i think it's that normalization which is so scary and the uh, disgusting events of october the 7th in israel the hamas terrorist attack has Mm. added fuel to some of the fires that, that, that were already burning and for a lot of my callers my jewish and muslim callers they they always find the I don't think it's a confected opposition of anti-Semitism with Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hatred. D- depressing, uniquely depressing in many cases, because they have their roots in almost identical places, which is what makes the actions of, of the, the far right on this issue so interesting. Mm. I mean, as you say, the similarity here is, is that people homogenize entire communities mm. based on the actions of, of terrible extremists doing awful things. I mean, the far right has kind of broadly split on this issue in terms of which side they're choosing, or that's obviously a wrong framing. Sure. But they, the ones that hate Muslims the most are saying that they support Israel, and the ones that hate Jews the most are saying they support Palestine. Um, and... And so the, they're kind of picking along those signs, homogenizing whole communities and saying all Jews are like this, all Muslims are like that. And then they're picking the side on the ones that they most dislike. I think the other scary thing is the kind of people that are traditionally said they weren't anti-Semitic on the far right. We're seeing much more anti-Semitism emanating out of those circles at the moment, even saying that they think Jews are forcibly pushing you know, Muslims into Europe, etc. So... They are broadly oh, that's quite excited. Like the double whammy, then. That's yeah, yeah. It's an extra level of conspiracy. And Good lord, I haven't come across that myself. And it's this kind of notion that there is a conscious plan to to kind of create a genocide of white people in Europe. And the far right are quite excited in some senses because they are always excited when they see that they're saying something that other people outside of their movements agree with. It's the same reason why they talk mm. about transgender people so regularly. It's so the same reason they attack migrants so regularly. It's often because. They, they're saying things that they think lots of people agree with and it opens up a door into the mainstream for them. Um, do, you, do you think Frank Hester's comments this week about Diane Abbott would have been responded to more robustly by a Conservative Party in previous years? Do you think perhaps this story is evidence of what you're describing when you use the word normalising? Because yeah. they can call the words unacceptable but the, but the money's still in their bank account. Of course. I, I mean, I think there's... I mean, the fact that it took them so long to come out and say that it was racist when it was so transparently racist um, is just the latest in in a long line of things that's happened in the last few years where comments and attitudes that would have traditionally been confined beyond the Conservative Party are now emanating from within it and the defence of these individuals the slowness with which they react to things that are so blatantly obvious and the way that obviously rhetoric for example I always go back to Suala Braverman talking about invasion in the House Mm. of Commons and those sorts of things this is rhetoric that when I started 15 years ago we would expect to see on the streets at English Defence League demonstrations now we're hearing it from Conservative Party ministers and and the the Hester is just the latest example of of rhetoric and ideas that I think even David Cameron's government which for all of its many problems Mm. and and Theresa May's for all of the many problems with hostile environment I think would have balked uh, the some of the stuff that they are letting slide at the moment and it really is a sign of just how normalised far-right rhetoric is in, in the ma- mainstream of our politics. That's something that Saeed Avasi, who was of course in David Cameron's cabinet, talks with me about a lot in this week's Full Disclosure, but I should mention that Joe himself has appeared on a previous episode of, of Full Disclosure, Joe Mulhall, Research Director at Hope Not Hate and author of Drums in the Distance um, in a riveting book. Uh, I'll tell you the subtitle and then you'll know exactly what it's about. Journeys into the global far-right, journeys that he undertook himself um so do check out both of those full disclosure with joe mulhall and drums in the distance joe i I don't know so do i say always a pleasure i mean it is always a pleasure to listen to you but like you i wish there wasn't so much in your field of expertise at the moment to talk about hopefully what next year will come in and we'll say actually it's all been solved but i wouldn't hold your breath (laughs) it's (laughs) 1201 james o'brien on lbc
Oh, five minutes after 12 is the time, your weekly opportunity to find a little fun and frolic in the middle of your radio dial. Um, I'll tell you briefly how it works. Someone rings in with a question, someone else rings in with an answer. That someone could, of course, be you. And it gets, it gets better. It gets better. Seriously. If you're my favourite contributor of the week, you can win a Mystery Hour ball game. I think, and we may need to check this, is this currently the only feature on British radio exciting and popular enough to have spawned its own board game? I mean, they have happened in the past. I have seen them in the past, but I think that this is the only... I think it is. Someone's going to correct me now, probably. I'll have to issue a grovelling apology to... Oh, I don't know who. I, uh, we, anyway, they, they... Oh, probably Popmaster, actually. There's probably a Popmaster ball game. All right, I'll take that back. Scratch all of that. Forget I ever said it. Anyway, you can win a brilliant, brilliant Mystery Hour board game, one of the only radio features ever to spawn its own board game, um, by being my favourite contributor. Uh, find out the full terms and conditions for the competition at lbc.co.uk. Or go to... Uh, mysteryhour.co.uk to find out more about the game. Well, you can't really find... Well, you can find out a bit more about the game, but more importantly, you can buy the thing. Oh, that's what you want to do. That's what you really want to do. Six minutes after 12 is the time. Um, just, a, just a quick one on uh, Edwin Collins and, and orange juice and the important explanation, clarification I provided a moment ago that when Keir Starmer said he discovered orange juice when he went to Leeds University, he wasn't talking about the drink, although quite a few of you have been in touch to tell me that growing up, for example, in rural Cornwall in the 1960s, we never had orange juice. I, I, I do like it when the, when the inbox goes off on a complete tangent, but somewhere on the interwebs, and I think we found this before, somewhere on the internet, I appear in a, an improvised comedy drama television program with Edwin Collins of, of Orange Juice, playing a, a sort of, well, playing a music journalist. So I, I'm not even joking. So somewhere, I think someone dug it out. Was someone? I appear also on a Michael Crick documentary about Tony Blair, and someone found that when we mentioned it on air. I also appear in the background of... Vera Lynn's 80th birthday party at the Imperial War Museum when Margaret Thatcher was in attendance and someone found that. I'm telling Bob Holness a joke in the background. Two LBC legends in the same room. I'm telling Bob Holness a joke and someone found that footage. So it's astonishing what people can find. I don't have the skills, the, 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 the research skills to do it, but I, I, I'm not making this up. When I was on the Express, Edwin Collins wanted a journalist to come and play a journalist when he was filming a, an improvised comedy show about a, a, a mythical theater, a pop band. And I did it. And I remember I came out with a phrase. I can't remember whether it made the final cut or not. But I said something like, this isn't music. This is music. Which I was really pleased with at the time. Should we get on? Yeah, I think we should get on with Mystery Hour, actually. Don't you? Brian's in Wigan. Brian, question or answer? Question, please, James. Carry on, Brian. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have met met at your gig at the um, at the hall in Manchester. It was it? Was tell uh, you what, Brian? Are you, have you warmed up yet? Uh, no, I haven't. It, it was yeah. freezing. I've never been in such a cold room in my life. It was absolutely <laughs> outrageous. I can't believe what they charged us and they didn't put the radiators on. But we digress. It's like thank you for coming yeah, along to it, it. It was frosty. I'm part of the Dream Team. If you remember the Dream Team, fantastic. Um, um, why are some people in Belgium called Flemish? Because they are Flemings. Really? Yeah. Where is the country of Fleming then? I don't know. I think it's just a, 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 a someone else will know the answer, but it's probably got something to do with religion, hasn't it, and language. But they are. I mean, it is. It, it refers to a dialect. It refers to a language. Most people in Belgium are Flemish, but I don't know any more than that. I think what I'm doing now is scrabbling around. For information that, um, for information that I, I can remember from a previous answer to a previous question, and I've run out. I've got nothing else. Flemish, Flemings, Flemings is definitely a thing because it feels a bit like flamingos. Flemings, Fleming. No, right, Brian. Thank you, mate. I shall do my best to get you an answer. Why are some Belgians called Flemish? Well, Flemings. They are Flemish. What does it mean? Uh, is there a Flemland? Where, where does the word come from? All of those, please, and more. Twelve oh nine is the time. I'm just going to chop that down. Brian and Flemish. Uh, Mark is in Morden. Mark, question or answer? Hey, James. Um, I got a question for you today. Yeah. Um, my question is about. Um, uh, glass like uh, windows right. what is it about glass that allows light to travel through it but um, for other solid objects like can't it just like hits it well it's transparent 
Right, but what but what what does that actually mean? Though we, we, it we, means we light can pass through. It. Right, but but why? Why? Because it it's about transparent. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that we could be here a while, but I don't know that there's any more to add to it. Is there? Well, there has to be something specific about the, um, the object is. itself that allows it to be transparent, that allows the light to pass through it. But I'm wondering... No, like, what you is, can't, what is you can't conflate makeup? the two things. The light can pass through it because it is transparent. And it is transparent because light can pass through it. I don't, I don't, I don't know what else... I don't, I, I don't know what else you would... What else you would find. Mm, okay. I don't know. I, I mean, I could be making a fool of myself again. But I, I mean, you mean what is the quality of transparency? What, what do not, what, what? Pro, I mean, it means that yeah, light can like, pass through. It, or it? like at the, uh, on, on the other side, like what is the bit of light that allows to, to pass through a transparent object? No, you can't change else? your question now. That's not, that's not how it works <laughs> at all. But so that, I mean, like, what is it about glass that means light can travel through it, even though it's yeah. solid? Yeah. All right. I, I mean, I, if someone rings in and says it's because it's transparent, I'm going to ban them from the program forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost certain now, thinking about it, there's going to be a more intelligent answer to this than I've managed to come up with. Because there is a rule, one of the golden rules of Mystery Hour, is that if I think a question's daft, it's usually me that ends up looking daft. Uh, 11, not always mind. Paul's in Rayleigh. Paul, question or answer? Uh, question, please, James. Carry on. Um, it's a music question. So, um, nice. where does the suspense uh, music dum 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 originate from? Silent films. Well, they're silent, so yeah, but they had music, didn't they? Clever clocks. <laughs> it's going to be one of those weeks, isn't it? The silent films. Everyone does their own sound effects. No, they had they had a musical accompaniment to silent film. It must. It must have been. It's, it's like you know the the cliffhanger music at the end of an episode when she's tied to the train tracks or something. Dun dun dun. I'm pretty sure that's right, and so are you deep down. But obviously, I can't prove it, and I don't have any qualifications. <laughs> Fair enough. So Fair I'll enough. leave it on the okay. board. I'll leave it. Dun dun dun. Can we find it, Keith? Is that too much? Like, is that too difficult? We'll be able to find it. Dun dun dun. Because it's going to sound awful if I have to keep doing it. Right. I I, I put. Oof. If I was if I was Frank Hester, I'd put ten million quid on it being f something to do with silent films, but um, but I'm not, so we'll call it fifty p. Thank you. Um, do you know? Have we done this before, Paul? Do you know why Rayleigh is a particularly pertinent place to Mystery Hour? Um, it well, I do know that it was the only place in the Doomsday Book where the castle had a vineyard. Is that true? Yeah, I read that in a book it, I'm reading at the moment. It's not uh, hundred years of a hundred like years it. of Rayleigh. No, no, a thousand years of annoying the French. Oh, well, um, okay, it's, that it's sounds fun. There. Um, the reason why Rayleigh has a particular place in Mystery Hour, in the hearts of Mystery Hour fans, is that the highest honour you can achieve on Mystery Hour is a Rayleigh Ota, which is when I play a oh, little of clip of the late actor Rayleigh Ota um, uh, uh, sharing the motto of, of the whole programme, not just of Mystery Hour, although we play it more often on Mystery Hour than any other time. And many people believed for some time, and some still do, that the award is actually a Rayleigh Ota. And they don't no understand. Yeah, well, there are no otters in Rayleigh, but they don't know that, and they don't understand why a radio show would make a song and dance about an otter in Rayleigh, and then play a clip of some unidentified American actor talking about if you build it, they will come. So for years, people were listening to that, going, "What the hell is going on?" And and oh, there aren't any otters in. So that's why we have a soft spot for Rayleigh. Well, that's nice, isn't it? You live in I'm, I'm going. I'm I'm going otter hunting now. That's <laughs> well, good luck. It is 14 minutes after 12. We need to know where does that dun 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 music come from? Why does light pass through glass? You can't say because it's transparent. And what what what, what a Fle where, where does Flemish? What does Flemish Flanders? Is it Flanders? Is it is it Flanders? Fl Flemish Flanders Flanders Flemish. Ned Flanders? I don't know. 12, 14, 12, 15, give or take. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 12 is the time. It's nearly Friday. Well, in terms of the time we spend together, it's not It's not nearly Friday in terms of your life and your day, but I've got, you know, it'd be one o'clock soon and then it's Friday, effectively, for us. It's, and we still haven't talked about the um, the photo, have we? It's getting madder and madder, this story. I, I mean, truly, truly bonkers. I, I suggested to you, it sounded like something out of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, that, didn't it? Truly, truly scrumptious. 
Uh, I said to you yesterday, the maddest thing about the whole thing for me is that somebody somewhere, some very influential and important people who know everything about what's going on with Kate uh, and William Windsor, have decided that all of this speculation is preferable to just putting the unvarnished truth out there. That's the bit I can't quite get my head around because it gives some credibility to some of the conspiracy theories. Not all of them, so I mean, but some of them. And I'm, I suggested to you yesterday that the Daily Mail had taken an interesting step when they turned on Kate um, and they uh, deployed one of their uh, professional sort of spitters of bile to claim that somehow Kate and William needed to reveal the details of what was going on, otherwise they were going to drown in a quagmire. You can't drown in a quagmire, but since when did the Daily Mail care about such technicalities? Uh, and I, I thought that was a bit odd, because it was a little bit of proof of Prince Harry's uh, explanation that these people will turn you. So I suspect the Daily Mail's mailbag exploded yesterday with readers absolutely outraged that a columnist called Sarah Vine should have dared to criticise the saintly Kate because today they've had to stick it on the front page male readers and columnist Bell Mooney unite to say give Kate a break I'm not I'm not a, a complete expert on such matters but I imagine that there was a bit of a panic at the Daily Mail yesterday when the readers actually responded to Sarah Vine's article um and uh, well it re results in a page four full page story it's time to back off and give kate space say male readers your letters special pages 56 and 57 and uh, economist bell mooney writes i'm recovering from surgery too and i know how helpless and humiliated the princess will be feeling that's why she must now be left in peace to heal a completely different daily mail that had on its front page yesterday the insistence that they better come clean soon, otherwise they'll be drowning in a quagmire of their own making. It's almost as if these people don't believe in anything. They sometimes forget whether it's the tail that wags the dog or the dog that wags the tail. Back to mystery, I thankfully. Raj is in Manchester. Raj, question or answer? It's a question, James. Carry on. OK, so let me get the question up clearly first. OK. So if a man is unwell, so let's say he's 70% in himself, so he's been, he's had a cold or a flu or something, but he's only about 70-80% in himself. Yeah. So then, let's say his partner is ovulating, so they have sex. Right. Does that mean the sperm that fertilises the egg would be less, less as, well, if you say 70-80%, and therefore would the child, if there is one born, would be less, there would be not as 78 it would only be 70-80%. Because the father was originally unwell. I'd say it's a quite a complicated question. This. I know, I know. That's why I tried to get it out clearly as I can. Uh, Does well, it make sense if I explained it? No, you've, yeah, well, because I, I know a bit about this because we, we, we had fertility treatment back in the day. But I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know whether I know enough to answer what it is you're asking. The, the, the bottom line is yes, that your, your fertility, your quality of sperm can be affected by things like flu. And and, okay. and so, but that I don't I don't think that there's such a thing as a defective sperm. So it would just lower the likelihood of you fertilizing your partner's egg. It would lower the likelihood of a pregnancy, but it wouldn't mean that if a sperm because to get through to make it through, a yeah. sperm's got to be in pretty good nick. So yeah. the ones that make it are not going to make it, and then somehow be subpar which i think is also part of what you're asking yes it is because obviously there's a child if it is one born no it doesn't work part, like that it, it doesn't it doesn't i don't i'm 99 percent sure i mean i'm no you know geneticist but i'm 99 percent sure it doesn't work like that well hopefully a doctor will come on and the fertility what do you mean a doc what do you mean hopefully if i've given you a hundred percent answer on your first you question 99%, and 99 percent on your second question it's not there's you're not gonna oh. have you're not going to have a. I mean, you put. I can't believe they've let you on, frankly, Raj. You've put me in such really? a difficult. Well, I mean, well, I've nearly said something. Then you're not going to have a. You're not going to have a. I can't. I can't. Flip it, Eck. What have you put this fella this is, through I, for? I think it's a very interesting question. Well, it might be a very interesting question, but it's daytime radio. I can't start talking. No, but it's not like a. Like what? A, no, like it, you know, There's nothing wrong with you. I'm not happened, cross but... with you. I'm not cross with you, Ross. Oh, You've okay. done nothing wrong. You oh, rang in in good no, faith. Don't, don't, say anything, don't say anything about your producers and, and the researchers because they've been very kind there and I've been on a few times. To I'm you, like, they have. They've been kind exactly. to you. They've hung me <laughs> out. To, they've hung me out to dry, they mate. Have, they have. But I've been trying my best to get on for this question. So I've been ringing for about three, four weeks, really, and they've yeah, always been putting well, me off. So well, they finally yeah. got me on. Well, there you go. <laughs> Patience is a virtue. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, all right. Um, 
Have you got a you bit poorly at the moment? Is that why you're worried? No, no, I'm fine. I, my kids are old enough. I've got an 18 year old and a 16 year old. There's no way I'm having any more. So you're out of that game. You're just, you're just oh, curious. Absolutely. You're absolutely. Just... I'm, I'm wondering whether I was ill when I conceived my two. That's what it is. Right. Good Lord. This is taking a. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a downward turn. This conversation, James. It certainly has. Oh, right, I'll try and find out. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that. That. So here's the question, right? Illness affects sperm, but does that affect a, a child born as a consequence of that? Oh Lord above! What are you? What are you even thinking? Putting this through? I can't. I just, Thank you, Raj. Again, I, I shall take out all of my d unhappiness on my colleagues, not on you. Uh, let's go to Adriana, who's in Walton on Thames. Adriana, what would you like to say? Oh, I've got an answer for the Flemish thing. Happy days. Carry on. Right. So Belgium is divided into two two sections. Yes. One is the French speaking section, which Walloons. is Wallonia. Walloons. And the and the Dutch speaking section is um, Flem, Flem, uh, Flem, Flanders, Flem, Flanders, 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 which is in Dutch is Flanderen, and oh, the people speak is. Flemish. That's it then. It's pretty straightforward. So it comes from Flanders. Uh, it comes from the Dutch, the, the original yep. word for which we've anglicised into Flanders, and the language that you speak if you're from Flanders is Flemish. It's like Dutch, but very bastardised. Can most people speak both? If you can speak Flemish, you can speak Dutch. If you can speak Dutch, you can speak uh, Flemish. Or? Yeah, although we think that Dutch, I'm Dutch, and we think we're posher than they are. Is that right? And those and yeah. qualifications are? I'm Dutch. That'll do uh, nicely. I learned it at primary uh, school. And can most Belgians speak Flemish and uh, French? Yeah, uh, I, I think definitely the French-speaking one can speak Flemish. But I think it's yes, both ways. I think you have to learn it at, at primary school. So, so, if you so, don't so, speak it at home. Germanic language, very close to Dutch, but it'll have mm. a lot of French in it as well. And then if you get into southern Belgian or Wallonia... It's completely French. It's, it's French all day long. Uh, yeah. Round of applause for Adriana, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First one of the day. Uh, 12.25 is the time. John is in Leamington Spa. John, question or answer? Answer, James. Carry on, John. Uh, so, why is glass transparent? Um, it's basically because uh, the light, uh, the light waves that sort of come from you know any light source do not interact with the the solid structure of glass. So, um, infrared and uh, UV waves can be blocked, um, but in typical fashion, uh, normal white light, uh, normal white light waves uh, aren't aren't blocked at all. It is, unfortunately, please don't hate me for saying this, it's the very definition of the word transparent. Well, that's what From I thought. From a scientific point of view. No, I, well, you've done your best, but I knew that that's what was lurking. That was the elephant in the room, wasn't it, John? Yeah, unfortunately You've just so, defined yeah. transparent, effectively. So when he asked, yeah. when, when Mark said, what, 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 why does light pass through it? I said, because it's transparent. And you were you were one hundred percent right. Why well, is it transparent? Because light, light waves passes don't through it. it. It's a perfect yeah. question, but absolutely awful for mystery hour. To be honest, I'd have got cross about that question if it wasn't for Raj popping up a few minutes ago with an even worse one. What are your qualifications? Uh, I have a master's in chemical engineering. Ah, there you go. Round of applause for John. Beautifully done. <laughs> Beautifully done. Twelve twenty-six is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Jack's in Bristol. Jack, question or answer? Question, please. Carry on. Now, Keep calm, because it's somewhat of a motoring question. Oh, Lord above. This is what I knew it was going to be one of those <laughs> weeks. They do this. Do you know, they genuinely do this. They actually sort of... My own colleagues troll me live on the radio uh, uh, between right. 12 and 1 on a Thursday. Go on, then. Fill your boots. Right. We are a family of one car. Often, I'm away using car. Yeah. What I want to know is why taxis are legally exempt from safety belts when it comes to young children. Like car seats. So, like, you have a car seat yeah. and it doesn't have to be belted up, right? So, yeah. I can't think of any reason. Uh, and it's on the government um, website to say it's, you know, they are exempt. I can't think of any reason, logically, why you're allowed to somewhat endanger your kids. So, what do you mean? You, you can take a child into a taxi without using a car seat? Yeah. 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 So, even if they're, you know, really young, you know, a week old, you can you, sit you with them on the back seat holding them. Or yeah. the front seat, I suppose. I didn't know so that. I've got, uh, the only thing I can think of, right? Yeah. Is You're not really supposed to answer your own questions. Yeah, well, I don't have it right. I don't have the knowledge. I'm sure a taxi driver will call up. But, you know, maybe there's a little bit of time saved between passenger and passenger so taxi drivers can, you know, use that time to get another customer. 
because of the time taking a safety belt. Oh, uh, yeah, it could be that. It could you know be what I mean? Yeah, that's um, so not it's good a, enough reason. Well, it's a cost-benefit ratio, isn't it? It's, it, it, it that most things like this are. So somewhere yeah. a calculation has been made that it would it would that it would harm the taxi driver, and the likelihood of well, I, I mean, it's a great question. Why 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 don't children have to use car seats in taxis? Because on a higher oh. car you do. Well, I don't know if you have to. I presume you have to because you 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 know you get to the higher car place and there's a big pile of car seats in the back, isn't there? And you try and get hold of one. And having said that, the taxi firms often have car seats as well. But you've double checked, and there is no legal requirement to do it. That's, yeah, there isn't any legal requirement, no. Right, you're on. It's a good question. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. It's not really a motoring question. Tech, tech, pass. Oh, well, I mean, it is, but it isn't. But it is, but it isn't. Well, oh, Bill's found it. Can you believe it? Bill has found the, the, the... God, look at me there. When would that have been? That thing I did with Edwin Collins. He's found some pictures. He hasn't... It's not moving footage. They're stills. I forgot what I looked like without a beard. Remembered why I grew one. Um, but look at all my lovely hair as well. So that thing I was talking to you about, I can't remember what it was called. Bill, can you? Um, but I, sh- I tell you what, I'll retweet it so you can have a look. There it is. Uh, you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.33 is the time. We've done the Flemish. We've done the glass. Uh, where does the cliff... Have we got any cliffhanging music, Keith? Nothing at all? Well, I'm going to have to do it myself. Dun, dun, dun. dun. What? Okay, sorry. Dun, dun, dun! So put some effort in. I can't put any more. You put some bloody effort in. You're supposed to be finding a clip of it. Honestly. Um, then there's Raj's question about sperm and Jack's question about seatbelts. Why is uh, taxis, you don't have to put a kid in a child seat, a child in a child seat. How come? What's the, what's the reasoning behind that? Do we know? And some breaking news for you. Here it is. I should have known. I'm so sorry. I should have blinking known. I, I should have known. I, guess what? There's another five million quid. I just did a mug to camera then for YouTube. There's another five million quid. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that bell. Ding, ding, ding. Hey, YouTubers. There's another five million quid. Steve, what's his name? Frank Hester. There's another five million pounds that hasn't come out yet. This is sort of like, uh, there's only a roundup. This is Tortoise reporting it. Kat Nealon at Tortoise, brilliant journalist. A Tory source said the party was sitting on the cash. The Conservatives have received an as yet undeclared five million pound sum from Frank Hester. They can't give it, so that would put him on 15 million. He is already responsible for 10.2 million of the 48 million that the party received in donations last year. I don't think they'll have received that much this year so far. Five million quid currently sitting there, which would then come out in the next round of um, disclosures. Uh, Conservative Party spokesman did not deny that the party had received the additional £5 million, telling Tortoise declarable donations will be published in the usual way by the Electoral Commission. How much money is he making out of these government contracts? Imagine having £15 million quid to spare. The only silver lining to this whole <clears throat> sorry saga is that he's, I mean, surely not going to get the knighthood or the, or the seat in the House of Lords that he's so obviously pitching for. Surely even this lot, I suppose resignation honours be extraordinary. I mean, there'd be all sorts of... But if you look at... The problem with saying there's no way they could put this character in the House of Lords is that a very quick look at who Boris Johnson did put in the House of Lords and to a lesser extent David Cameron and, of course, to an equal extent Liz Truss uh, rather, rather proves the point they'll put anyone there these days. 12.36 is the time. Excuse me. Walker is in Nelson in Lancashire. Walker, question or answer? Hello, James. It's a question, please. But can I just say thank you for the answer I got about my transplant organs? Um, that was a while asked, ago. Asked, it was a while ago. You asked all the right questions in response that I would have asked as well, so thank you for that. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Glad to be of service, Walker. <laughs> so my question today is, when we have to write a word multiple times... Yeah. Why does it start to look wrong? Crikey, that's a bit philosophical. Well, no, not even. What is it? We said, they, I, what, I mean, A, are you sure that it does? Are we, are we sure yeah. that it, yeah? We, so you write, I'm just going to practice it now. I'm going to write poem. <laughs> poem. Poem. This is amazing radio. Stay there, everyone. Poem. Po- po- poet. Poem. Po- P- po- oh, look at that. You're right. 
It's like you start thinking, is it P-E-O-M? Or p- p- po- poem? Poem, 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 poem. What? So you, if you write down a word multiple times, at one point you will start wondering if you're actually writing it down correctly. Yes. That's a great question. I'll tell you what, though, I'll be amazed if we get an answer. Who's going to know the answer to that? No idea. No, not me. That wasn't, I mean, that was a rhetorical question. But Walker, (laughs) leave it with me. I I mean, you were a very satisfied customer last time. You may be a less satisfied customer this time. There's a challenge for the etymology. I don't know. What would it be? Etymology? I don't know what it would be. Um, Words looking weird. Steve's in Oxford. Steve, question or answer? Answer. Carry on, Steve. Uh, Relates to uh, child seats in private hire taxi coaches, minibuses and and the like because it also this uh, question sort of covers um coaches buses and minibuses as well just didn't, so you didn't know, know that but now you come to mention it i've never seen a child seat on a bus no it's it's you know they're just not there the part, part of the problem is that um dri- dri- private home taxi drivers and companies cannot be sure um of what um what they may be um are requested for when 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 collecting a passenger, yes. certain place of, of public hire vehicles, uh, they cannot be sure who's going to hail them, and whether they would have a, an appropriate seat to, to satisfy the need. Um, the there is a question over liability slightly because um, uh, we've had a case recently where an individual had a, pa- a passenger with a child on their lap. The passenger in the rear vehicle chose to take off their seatbelt and were consequently stopped by the police, mm. which still. Um, even though the passenger was liable, there were questions over the safety and the fit and properness, basically, because there is still a duty of care. I don't want to go too deeply into the law over this, but it, it, it is um, it, it, there, there are still potentially penalties, much the right. same as a private hire or taxi driver do not have to wear a seatbelt when they're driving a passenger for their own safety. And I knew that. So, I knew that. Yeah. So, um, so that's primarily the reason... Um, but obviously, um, when, when they're under three, it's also more difficult because there is a slight question over government law, what it says about three-year-olds being unrestrained in the rear of vehicles as well, so, or up to, the, up to the age of three. So it, it is slightly um, sort of back to front, as it were. But, but the primary reason is because drivers can't have a selection of um, seats available to them in a vehicle. If somebody pre-books with a car service, Normally it can be arranged, but generally speaking, most drivers wouldn't have them on board. Hey, blimey, that's a pretty comprehensive answer. Qualifications? Uh, I, I drove for 26 years and I'm an uh, officer for GMB Union uh, re- representing private iron taxi drivers. Blimey, that'll do. Round of applause. How many are there? How many officers are there for the GMB Union representing private hire taxi drivers? Well, uh, se- seven regions plus a national lead now, which yeah. I used to do. Um, and and thousands of members, you know, yeah. everyone from uh, uh, private hire and taxi uh, all, all over all over the country to uh, you know the the app drivers that you all know about. Nice and, work, and, nice work, know, Steve. Yeah. Round of applause. Thanks. No, thank you. <laughs> Top man, Steve. Well played. Uh, Twelve forty. Andy's on the Norfolk Broads. It says here. Question or answer, Andy? James. Whereabouts on the Norfolk Broads? Uh, I live on a uh, little known um, village called Martham, with the word Martham Broad. Um, quite like Martham. Near, near Roxham? Near Roxham? Very oh, near Roxham, yeah. It yeah. is very near Roxham. I, I like the Norfolk Broad. Do you know, can I confide in you, Andy? So, uh, just me and you, yeah? Yeah, Fine, just yeah. me and you. I, uh, I get a bit of, I get a bit panicky when I think about the Norfolk Broads, because I, what I'd really like to do hmm. is, is go on a boating holiday on the Norfolk Broads. Okay. But I once hired a very small boat out of Roxham, <laughs> actually. Yeah. And I I couldn't park it. <laughs> That's generally the case, unfortunately. Well, everyone else was doing all right. I, I, I couldn't park it to the point where I tried on a couple of occasions, and I got so self-conscious about people on the bank mm. watching me mess it up time and time again that we spent our entire trip moving. Well, I, I think a lot of people don't realise that the Bure and the Yar is tidal and yeah. has quite a strong current so when you do come to park it because it does it sound so bad. romantic you're very 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 kind it was nothing to do it was like a mill pond mate it was as flat as a pancake i just rubbish i'm trying to give you a reason i know you are and i'm grateful a very yeah. very famous person who has a beautiful boat that they keep on the norfolk broads even offered me a lend of it and i had yeah. to say in, in all honesty i can't possibly borrow your boat because i will sink it <laughs> 
Well, I like to watch people in the summer yeah. um, trying to do just what you described. You probably watched me, didn't you, mate? Possibly. Laughing your little socks off. <laughs> question or answer? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's what I called. <laughs> it's a question. Um, and the, the broads are relevant because this is a, a question regarding birds. Yes. Um, birds singing at night, not owls, obviously, but birds yeah. chirping, tweeting, whatever, singing at night in the dark. Is it a new thing? Because I've just noticed it recently. Same here. Where I same, can hear... Literally, same here. But, yeah, as it, so is it a new thing? I, I've literally noticed it in the last few months. Yeah, me too. How mad. Um, is there much light where you are, like street lights and stuff like that? Well, there's been a, a new development. Sort of the, the, the village is growing. Yeah. Um, there's a new development sort of 200 yards from where I live. That might be it, then. There's more street lighting, so I just think, is that confusing the birds? Is it making them think it's daylight? Because do you know what know. we've had done? We've had some new motion sensor lights put in out the back. Maybe that's what it is for us. Could be. Or, or is there a planetary phenomenon unfolding under our very noses? Possibly. Well, mate, well obviously, right. animals, animals know a lot more than we do. Um, <laughs> and maybe they know more than what's going on. I don't know. Who does? It's a mystery. How appropriate. Um, yes. <laughs> I... I hope this doesn't sound inappropriate, but a lot of people have been in touch wondering whether you work in voiceover or anything like that, Andy. <laughs> That's very kind. I, no. I just, See, I even that I chuckle did. there just clinched it, didn't it? Really? You sound like an absolute natural. Are you sure? You don't, I mean, I know you'd know. There'd be no reason to... We had two voiceover artists on the other day, but you don't, no, 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 never worked in those sort of thespian... Sort of... I, I've, I've had a lot of people say that, funny yeah. enough, and I, 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 I went and did some voiceover training right. um, oh. for, for public speaking, yeah. and then I realised how much I do not like rejection, and uh, I stopped sort of it's trying. It's not the game I, for you, I, then. I do a, um, I, I, I do a in North Norfolk. I do a uh, community radio show um, every two weeks. Um, not North North Norfolk, not North, North Norfolk Digital. <laughs> Pretty much, it's North <laughs> Norfolk Digital, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm under another name. Oh, that's fantastic! Because I mean, listen, this, listen to this. I love this guy's voice. I'm in love with Norfolk man's voice. Says Tracy, uh, guy from the Broads has a great voice. Says Jamie, man from Norfolk Broads has such an amazing voice. Says. Angela, there's loads of love for you coming, but no one ever says that about my voice. I do this for a living. <laughs> this is outrageous. Whereabouts I, I, in North Norfolk? Like What's the station called in North Norfolk? You don't have to tell me. I don't want to embarrass you, but I spend quite. Uh, like, well, it's, if, if anyone is interested, it's called Poppy Land Radio, and my show is the Classic Rock Show. Oh, of course it is. Come on, with that voice. What else is it going to be? It's the Classic Rock Show. I'll tell you what, because I, 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 I spend years, you know, because I, I do so much driving for a living, well, yeah. not for a living, but to, to get to work, obviously, and I. <laughs> amuse myself i do a lot of, I, I mimic a lot of voiceovers fantastic um, and i love your guy that says mystery hour basically calls it ah mystery hour mystery hour he does mystery so you, hour. you could do this with your eyes shut man i don't want to do him out of a job we're very pleased with what he does for us but i can see why you you flirted well, with it. If, if, if he ever needs a holiday please give me a call I, you know we will I, but you can stop now sending in all the love for what a sexy voice this one says Ooh. it's ridiculous <laughs> i think that one means me actually and <laughs> i'll try yeah, i must get you an answer to your question have a great day it's 12 45 James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 12.49. Thanks to Chris, Chris Brandish, who's, um, who's found the video of me acting with Edwin Collins 157 years ago. And, and you're right, it was called West Heath Yard. Look at that. I'll retweet that as well. There you go. I'm right near the end doing some acting. Amazing. Oh. Uh, anyway, back to the game in hand, which is Mystery Hour. Lots of questions, still need answers, but not that many. The one about sperm, the one about dun dun da the one about words and the one about birds. Birds and words and words and birds and birds and words and birds and words and words and birds. Jeremy's in Richmond. Jeremy, question or answer? Um, it's a question, um, James. Carry on, I'm Jeremy. Okay, okay, okay. It's a very worrying one. Okay. Um, oh. um, it's concerning two cats um, yes. in their 12th year Gosh. who both started watching television. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> and so is it, is it the gentleman, partner, Guy Ritchie's new Netflix fr thriller? No, 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 no. We've since discovered there's YouTube cat channels as well. But, but, but look, 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 we got a new TV. Yeah. Haruki walked, he, Haruki walked into the room and just stopped and, st and started staring at the television. With him, really? With him. And they'd never done this Marmite, before? They'd never done never, this before? Never, never, never. And then Marmite, his friend, walked in and sat there and started looking at the TV. And there's a photograph of them sitting watching TV together. Wow. And in their 12th never. year, they've never watched TV before, ever. It's a Samsung OLED TV. It's a right. kind of special screen, it's, I don't know. So something about has, the screen has hypnotised your cat? 
Yes, but why are they watching? They haven't watched TV since they were babies. And why are they watching TV now? That's, That's extraordinary. And it so, doesn't matter what's on. We're 100% sure they're not they, attracted um, they, to... They, 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 they watch the news. Yeah. Um, God, they they, they do bad. prefer their they prefer the YouTube um, squirrel channel. Watching they watch little animals news. running around. So yeah, what is it about your new TV that has, yes. that has captured your cat's attention? And they literally is. sit there watching. And it's very disturbing. I was thinking, is it a social trend? They see everyone walking around with phones and they're getting embarrassed. So they think you ought to be looking at Mofo, well. I believe it's called. No, FOMO, I believe it's called. Oh, right. <laughs> they're missing out, yeah. So perhaps they're suffering from FOMO. I don't know. But that's my question. There we well, go. That's a brilliant question. And it's a, an, uh, is it a 4D TV? Is that a thing? Is, I've been reading about 4D. I, anyway. Oh, God. It, it's a, I don't, it's a really expensive it's one. And how, and how, how old was the old one? How old was the old one? Oh, God, that was really new as well. Um, my partner broke it. She does um, Pilates video and she smashed the camera into it. Sensational. It. So that, was, that, was about, that was about two years old. Oh, so it wasn't. It's not like you were using an old sort of cathode no, ray no, 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 type. No, 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 she's, no, no, no. The cats. And thrice no. Well, I shall find out for you. I, I, well, I may not. It's quite late, but I should do my best, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, it's very good, by the way. If you like Guy Ritchie films, you'll love his new TV series, The Gentleman. Hard just seen it. Uh, it's pretty bloody, though. I like, like, gory. Uh, Kate's in Belper in Derbyshire. Kate, question or answer? Hello, Hello, it's Kate. an answer, James. Hi. Hi. We, we met, I saw you at Nottingham Playhouse. You were super. I, I think I was with a friend of yours. You're Jenny's friend. I am, yeah. How lovely hi. to hear from you again. Did you get your book all right? <laughs> yes, I have. Thank Fantastic. you so much. No, really thank you kind. so much. Thank you for coming. It was a great night. Um, so you're here to answer, well, I, I thought I would guess from your field of expertise, but there's nothing on my list that fits with your field of expertise. Well, it's the, um, when a word goes weird, when you Fantastic. say yes, it a lot. Yes, you write down write a word a or say it a lot, then suddenly you think that you're writing it wrong. Go on. Yeah, it's called semantic satiation. Whoa. Seriously? That's great, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, get in. Semantic satiation. (laughs) Yeah, it's called semantic satiation. Satiation, not association. Do you want to put your teeth in and try try again? (laughs) It's called semantic (laughs) satiation. Yes. Satiation, like when you're satiated, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's when we repeatedly say or write a word. And um, it's uh, it's a sort of breakdown of the long term auditory and verbal memory because Mm. we. We look at it several times and that function just kind of weakens and gives up because it's assumed that you you know, you already know it, it's in your long term memory. Yes. It's a phenomenon known with language and auditory information. Uh, yeah. I, so it is, because uh, yeah, this is your field. Well, I shall ask you what your qualifications are and you shall tell us. Yes, I'm a dyslexia specialist. So this is all about word recognition and the kind of the, the, the mental muscles that you deploy when you're reading and writing and things like that. Exactly. That's, That's exactly what it is. Beautiful yeah. answer. Round of applause for Kate, please. Thank you. No, thank you. Give my love to Jen. And I shall see you again. 12.54 is the time. Ollie's in Lingfield. Ollie, question or answer? Oh, James. Carry on, Ollie. Uh, it's the sperm question. Oh, great. Carry on. <laughs> um, so Imagine if someone's called... just turned their radio on. Like, literally, because they can't stand me, but they like to get in a bit early for Sheila Fogarty. Hello, Ollie. Well, question yeah. or answer? Crowd answer, James. What is that? It's the sperm question. Well, Carry on, It's then. following on from the man with the sexy voice. It's just, it's, it's, it is, yeah. in a way. Yes. On we go. So, anything that raises body temperature, i.e. gives you a fever, can kill off sperm because spermatogenesis, sperm are very, very temperature sensitive. That's yep. why testicles hang slightly outside the body. That's why they hang low. Um, <clears throat> they do hang low. Sweet uh, chariot. Oh, I was thinking more swinging them to and fro, but never mind. Um, yeah, so anything that will raise body temperature will kill them off. It will also affect spermatogenesis, which is the growth of new sperm, which happens three to four weeks before they actually get to the point where they're going to be released. So a temperature will drop sperm count, i.e. Vi- number of viable sperm. It won't do anything to the genetic makeup of that sperm because that was set weeks in advance, yeah. well, eight, weeks ago. But... In a few weeks' time, the sperm that are have been produced were in production, shall we say, yeah. whilst the fever or the illness was happening, they can be affected in terms of their viability, so their ability to actually swim, their ability to penetrate the egg when they yeah, get there. But if but, but um, there's no there's not going to be any impact on the health of the child. No. Because no, the sperm isn't going to get Genetically they are yeah, genetically they are set by a process that is set. The viability yeah. of them is in question, but the genetic makeup it's won't be. Great answer. And even if you're having treatment or ICSI, then they're they're looking for the most wriggly sperm anyway. So that, yes. that, that even in those circumstances it's not gonna have a deleterious yep. effect. What a beautiful answer. Question uh, uh, qualifications. <laughs> 
I'm a farm animal veterinary surgeon and one of my specialisms is uh, bull breeding soundness examinations for cattle. But bull what? Bull breeding soundness investigations. Oh, so you'd like bull sperm? Bull sperm yeah, tests? Yeah. Bull yeah. sperm analysis. We, Quite we a lot use, of money in that, isn't there? What's the most uh, money that you've ever come across for a bull's, for a dose of, for a load of bull sperm? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the straws that we deal with are a quarter of a mil, and it's not Shut uncommon. The front door, and you see, Eleanor looks shocked. I knew it was going to be so. Yes, mate, I swear, bull sperm. We're all in the wrong business. Go, so, a quarter of a million for one one lot. Quarter of a mil, no, as in a quarter of a milliliter. Sorry, oh. quarter of a milliliter. No, don't get excited. It's oh, not not that. Oh, it's not that liquid. Flipping out. Quarter of a milliliter tubes, and they can routinely cost forty to fifty pounds for a good bull. Oh, I thought there was some rumours. I thought that like some like a mega bull. Could... Yeah, there are. There's, a, there's been a few in time. That I think the most the most famous one that most people m- might have heard of outside of the veterinary industry or the, yes. the farming industry is probably Pixton Shuttle. He was a, a very famous one. That's the fellow. What did his uh, What does his sperm go for? A lot, uh, but there's not many now because he's obviously that was 15, 20 years ago. I think. Yeah. Um, Whoa! Yeah, no, there's, covered there's a some, lot of ground. Some, yeah. Round of there's applause for Ollie. Expensive stuff out there. There, there certainly is. Beautiful. I think the best stuff is called Gold Top. Chris is in Coventry. Chris, question or answer? It's an answer. Carry on. Hello, James. Hello, Chris. Lovely, uh, love the fun of the channel. Um, right, so answer for the, the reason why the cats have all of a sudden have started watching TV. Yes. And it's because modern TVs are built in such a way that they have a higher frame rate. Uh-huh. Now, the human eye to have fluid motion needs to have between 15 to 20 frames per second which is what a lot of gamer people will kind yeah. of attribute to the higher the yeah, frames but the new the telly's smoother. only two years newer than the old one that's true but because it's an OLED that also helps oh, does because it? of the way that the um, so I can't remember exactly what it stands for oh, but essentially it, it's, the frame rate's going to be higher so now, the, cat, the cat is watching the flicker rather than the picture as it were. Yeah, so the cat's essentially watching a slideshow, and Ooh. in between that slideshow, it's it's black and it's black and then coloured and black and then coloured. So he doesn't find it very interesting. Now, well, he does apparently. Actually, he can't take his eyes off it. Well, now it does, yeah, because because now he's seeing moving. Now he's have, ah. Have a, near, they need to see a hundred frames per second in order for them to see it as a fluid motion? So he's seeing picture. it more clearly. Yes. In, of a I've, show, the cat I've run out of time. Now she, she, Sheila's That's looking right. impatient. Qualifications? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have four cats of my own, and I'm an avid fan of cats. Well, yeah, but that's not a qualification. I mean, have you looked into it? No. How do you know what you've just told us? So I, I actually came across this exact question ten years ago when it piqued my own interest. I there was you wondering go. why. So you, so you dug it out, and you felt a round of yeah. applause for Chris. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. There we go. We've done it. And unfortunately, we haven't got time for Matthew's answer to the dumb, dumb, dumb question. The, the winner is sexy voice man. Sexy voice man on the Norfolk Broads, isn't it? I, I mean, it, it just—I mean, it could have been a lot of competition this week. Everyone, I'd like to have given one to everybody. I'd already given Kate a copy of my book, so she can't have the board game as well. That would be preferential treatment. So there, there you go. Goes to Andy, sexy voice man on the Norfolk Broads. If you missed any of today's show, did you hear sexy voice? Man? I did hear sexy voice man, and I, I have to say, when you said nobody tells you you've got a nice voice, I think you have a lovely voice. Thank you, Sheila. I think it sounds like a very kind voice. Oh, I well, don't know whether you're very kind. It doesn't matter, does Routine. it? Routine. Well, you've, never, you've always been kind to me. That's what a lovely thing to say. Yeah. Uh, yada, yada, Never mind LBC Norfolk app. voice. I know. But yeah. Andy, Andy <laughs> yes. on the classic rock show. How much has he had to smoke to get D- that voice? Download now for free from your app store. <laughs> Head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, Lewis Goodall in for Tom Sawbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thanks, James. James O'Brien on LBC.